a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. And now, the Goldbergs. It was Molly Goldberg and Molly Goldberg alone who had confidence in what Dr. Christopher Cater could do for her son and the girl with whom he tangled his life. Out of the confusion, out of the imminent tragedy, there shone one clear, calm light. And when Christopher started to treat Sammy, Molly felt a vast relief. The first objective evidence came to her eyes when Sylvia refused to marry Sammy. And now... Molly and Jake are at odds again because Jake can only see Sammy's anguish, his great unhappiness. Jake, dear, please, we know that Sylvia went to Dr. Cater's office, so we know it, so why do you have to wait up for Sylvia? And why should you wait? Her own father isn't waiting. Why should you wait for her? Because I, I have a few things to do anyway. What few things? Sorry. I have a few buttons to sew on. Uh... As you will, Molly. At Sylvia, I'm not much surprised. But a Dr. Cater, I am. Very. Very much indeed. Say, darling, you don't want to realize that whatever Dr. Cater is doing for Sylvia is purely as a doctor. That's what you think. And you think? Nothing. Nothing at all. Family? Why aren't you in bed, Sammy? Look what you look like, look. You go to bed, Jay, dear. You go up. I'll stir Sammy up something. Maybe he'll swallow a cup. Sammy? Awake. Wake up from your slumbers. Open your eyes. How long is this going to go on? How long? It's enough already. It's enough. Jake. Jake. Yes, Jake. What is that Jake supposed to mean? Keep quiet? Don't say a syllable? Don't open your mouth? How long more can I control myself? How long? Your lover? Marry her and finish, and that's all. You're no longer a baby. My head I can put on your shoulders. Would it I could... Would it I could, I would cut my head off and hand it to you on a silver platter. But it will only be after I'm dead that you'll realize that what we wanted for you was what was best for you. And then, it'll be too late. Mm. I don't blame him. I deserve a whole lot more than that. Family, you're tired. Yes, yeah, sure, sure, I'm tired. I'm tired of having my life open to the public gaze as if it were book for everyone to read. Oh, I want to be right or wrong my own way, Ma, without being helped by my dear friend, Dr. Cater. That's under his influence that Sylvia said what she said. Well, she's a disease in his eyes, and he's treating her. But in my eyes, she's not a disease. She's a human being, a person, a suffering, living, feeling person. And there's no use probing behind the scenes. You don't live with a person's reasons for being what they are. You live with what they are. All right, then. Go on. You're tired. No, no, I'm staying right here. I'm staying here till Sylvia gets back. Confused and distraught, overcome by his mixed hopes and desires, Sammy sits stubbornly in the kitchen, while Molly watches her son with the perpetual anxiety of every mother in the world. But outside, the night is soft and continuous with stars. And down the road that leads to the Goldberg house, Dr. Cater and Sylvia walk. A grave... A mysterious mood has fallen over Sylvia. Telling Sammy she wouldn't marry him has, has released something within her, a state of confession, a longing to reveal everything, without shame, without regret. And Dr. Cater knows it. Are you afraid of the night, Sylvia? No. It's one of the best traps nature ever laid. For what? For the human imagination. I shudder. Well, anyway, I think I should. Every time I come upon the night this way. I like it. Why? It's like being asleep. And you dream whatever you feel like. It's your own secret. But I'm here. You're just part of it. You haven't asked me why I came over to see you tonight. And you've walked and said nothing at all. You haven't said a thing. You came to see me. Yes. 
Sammy asked me to marry him tonight. He asked me in front of his parents and my father. Do you know what I said? Yes. How do you know? Because you came to see me. You said no. I said no. But, uh, what did that no mean? I don't know. Except that I could never marry Sammy. Not anymore. Not for anything. Not for anything? Not even for you. Uh, why did you want me to know tonight what you had said to Sammy? You must have had some other reason. Why, Sylvia? I came to tell you. You had succeeded. In doing what? In doing what I'd always longed for. Always. All those years up to now and everything I did, I acted because of the way I wanted to. It was what I wanted, what I desired, what I hoped for. I intended this thing and that thing. I seemed to have something in my head, some terrible creature that wasn't I, driving me on to the things I hated. I lived it and dreamt. Sometimes I dreamt there was another person living in me. Something crazy and frightening. And then... And then? And then... I don't know. But when Sammy asked me to marry him, the other person wasn't there anymore. She was gone. I couldn't find her. And all I could say was what you wanted me to say. Christopher? Yes, Sylvia? If this is what you wanted to do to me, you've done it. And what you want to do from now on, I don't know. All I know is that I would do anything you wanted. I could live or die if you told me to. I can't think except to think of what you say to me. Except of you and what you say. I... I had to tell you this tonight. Because... Now I... I can go home and go to sleep. Not care. Whatever I am, you've done. I'm going in now. That should better. The Goldbergs are still up? Yes. I'll come in with you. Why? Because I want to. Did you have a nice time? Are you waiting up for me? Yes, I... I thought I ought to give you the benefit of my superior knowledge. Do you have any? Not as much as you have, but just enough to warn Sylvia. Against me? Okay. Against herself. I think I'm going to bed. I think you ought to go to bed, Sam. Don't start mixing things up. Wait a minute, Sylvia. Sam. Now, Dr. Cater is a psychoanalyst and you're his patient. Sam. He thinks you're sick, Sylvia, and probably you are. And he's trying to cure you. Sam. Now, please, please let me talk. Now, there are a certain number of steps in the cure. Am I right, Dr. Cater? Sam, now, first, first the patient presents the doctor. Am I right? Yes, sir. Yes, you pass through that. Second, the patient is neutral. She gives the doctor a chance. After all, what harm is there? And besides, there's always the pleasure of finding someone to confess to. Sammy. You pass through that. And then there's the third, the great, beautiful, romantic step. Sammy. The patient falls in love with the doctor. You're just going into that, Sylvia. I can Sammy. see it, and so can he. It's the truth. Making you fall in love with him was part of Dr. Cater's treatment. A, a, a kind of emotional massage, that's all. I just want to warn you, Sylvia, before you begin making too much of it. Bitter words, froth at Sammy's mouth. True in a way, and yet false, too. Because they're falsely meant. What will Sylvia's reaction to this be? And what will Dr. Cater's be? The psalmist said, When I awake, I am still with thee. For the child of God, seeking the presence of the Lord is essential as each day begins. To help you in starting this day with God, we offer a brief devotional meditation from morning and evening, a collection from the pen of one of the greatest preachers of all time, Charles Haddon Spurgeon.
This morning's text comes from Romans chapter 8 and verse 30. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. Here is a precious truth for thee, believer. Thou mayest be poor, or in suffering, or unknown. But for thine encouragement, take a review of thy calling, and the consequences that flow from it, and especially that blessed result here spoken of. As surely as thou art God's child today, so surely shall all thy trials soon be at an end, and thou shalt be rich to all the intents of bliss. Wait a while, and that weary head shall wear the crown of glory, and that hand of labor shall grasp the palm branch of victory. Lament not thy troubles, but rather rejoice that ere long thou wilt be where there shall be neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. The chariots of fire are at thy door, and a moment will suffice to bear thee to the glorified. The everlasting song is almost on thy lip. The portals of heaven stand open for thee. Think not that thou canst fail of entering into rest. If he hath called thee, nothing can divide thee from his love. Distress cannot sever the bond. The fire of persecution cannot burn the link. The hammer of hell cannot break the chain. Thou art secure. That voice which called thee at first shall call thee yet again from earth to heaven, from death's dark gloom to immortality's unuttered splendors. Rest assured, the heart of him who has justified thee beats with infinite love towards thee. Thou shalt soon be with the glorified, where thy portion is. Thou art only waiting here to be made meet for the inheritance, and that done, the wings of angels shall waft thee far away, to the mount of peace and joy and blessedness, where, far from a world of grief and sin, with God eternally shut in, thou shalt rest for ever and ever. This meditation was taken from Morning and Evening by C. H. Spurgeon. Please listen each morning at this same time for Morning and Evening. Jealousy in the hearts of others. What a strange thing to say. 
at such a time. My dear, there will be those who will watch and ponder about this thing we see below us now. Yes, there will be those. And upon the parapet of another princely palace stand two men, one named Caiaphas and another named Annas, priest both of them. And both, both men concerned by the spectacle they witness. Well, Anas, do you see? Do you hear? Palm leaves and hosannas. Yes, Caiaphas, but it will pass. Will it? Have you ever seen such a reception for anyone in your lifetime? No. So something must be done. Done? What? Why? Fool! He has captured the people. If they follow him, what becomes of us? What is a high priest without followers? True, but what can we do, Caiaphas? Well, something must be done. Look at them. Listen to them. Well, this will change. It must change. And I think I know how. So, your name is Judas. Tell me, how long have you known him? Why, it doesn't matter. Don't tremble so, Judas. You're safe here. No one will ever know it was you. Now, tell me how long. If you persist in asking questions, Caiaphas, I won't do it. I'll leave. Well, I suppose one shouldn't look for noble qualities in an informer. You shouldn't have said that. No, no, no. Don't go. It was a badly chosen word. Now then, where will we find him? The garden. Gethsemane. Late at night. But all his disciples will be there. Then how will we know which one is he? I've thought about that, too. It must be done in a manner that won't get me away. And that would be the kiss of greeting. What could be more usual? Then the one you kiss, we take. Yes. Very good. We'll be there. Now, how much? I, I don't know. I asked how much. I don't have time to bargain. I have to get back and join the others for the feast. Well, then, is 30 pieces fair? I don't know. Well, what do you usually get? Now, see here. Yes. All right. 30. I was prepared for that. You'll find the 30 pieces in this pouch. Now, Judas, get on to your feast. I remember that. Peter, did you notice? What, John? You mean how calm and peaceful the master seems? And look at Judas, the last to enter. He glances about as though he were afraid of something. The master is the one who should be afraid. His hour is coming as he foretold it to us, yet he said nothing. He's done nothing. Wait, Peter. He's reaching for a basin. Master, here. Here's the basin and a pitcher of water. If you desire to wash, Lord, allow me to help. Peter, look. Master. Master, no. You kneeling at my feet. Oh, no, it cannot be. I should kneel at your feet. Master, you wash my feet. It's I who should wash you. What I do, you know not. But you shall know hereafter. Please, Lord. You shall never wash the feet of one so undeserving as I. If I wash you not, you have no part of me. Then, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. anyone ever shown greater humility? Now he's beginning to wash the feet of the others also. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, 
you also ought to wash one another's feet. I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than the master. It is somehow the beginning of the end, John. Yes. As though the washing of our feet were the first step toward what will end as he prophesied to us only two short days ago. If he would say a word or give a sign, I'd offer my life in his place, I would. No one can offer his life in place of the master. Look, he's saying a prayer over the bread now. And he breaks it into little pieces. Do you see how many pieces? Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It means one for each of us. Come, we must pass them down the table to the others. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. But, Master... Yes, Peter... The chalice of wine, Master. Is that what you reach for? I'll fill it, Master. He's blessed it, Peter. Now take it. Pass it for each man to drink. Yes, John. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Now I say unto you, one of you which eateth with me shall betray me. Christ, oh, is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall he betray me. Master, is it I? Thou hast said. That which you do, do quickly. I'm going to stop him, John. If the master was one of them stops, wouldn't he have said so? But you heard it just as I did. What's the matter with all of you? Would you let that traitor go? Would you let him betray the master? Well, I won't. If it cost me my life, I'm going after Judas. I'll stop him. It seems I'm the only one who's brave enough. Wait, Peter. The master would speak to us. You will all be offended this night because of me. No, master. Not I... For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. No, Master, no. If the others be offended because of you, I will not. Oh, no, not Simon Peter. I'd go to prison with you. I'd even go to death with you. Believe me, Master. I say unto you, this day, even in this night, before the cock crows twice, you shall deny me three times. No, Lord. If I should die with you, I would still not deny you. Not in any way. Not in any way. him and yet not try to escape. He wouldn't be the one we think he is 
if he were to try to escape. But to die in that way, surely he must know what suffering that means. What a bitter cup it is to drink. That's why he prays, as he does now. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Simon, sleepest thou? What? Master. Oh, Master, forgive me. I had fallen asleep. Could ye not watch with me one hour? Oh, Master, forgive me. John. What? James. Uh, wake. Wake up, all of you. Peter, uh, what happened? Uh, what are you asleep, Peter? We were all asleep. Rise. Behold... He is at hand that doth betray me. Where, Master? I don't see anyone or hear any. Wait. John, do you hear? Marching men. Torches. The clank of armor. Soldiers. Master, there may still be time to save yourself. Come with us. He won't move. Then I shall protect him. I have my sword. Can you make out any faces in the flickering torchlight? Soldiers, as I thought. Yes, but that one there, he wears no uniform. Look, he comes toward us now. Judas! Go on, which one is he? Friend, wherefore are you come? Hail. I greet you with a kiss. Nobody kiss me back! Wait! First, first man to touch him will feel the cut of his sword! Oh, oh. Peter! Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. But, Master, shall I stand by to help us? Is there nothing I can do? I want to do this kiss around him! I 
say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Did you hear that? There yeah, we need no more witnesses. You go out here and this blasphemy. He's guilty. Yeah. shouting that way. They might have heard you. And they I don't care. They said he was guilty. Guilty. Yes, we heard. But why are you so concerned? I... I don't know what you're talking about. There's something strange about you. You must know him. You must be a friend of his. If you are, they'll be wanting you inside, too. No. Now that he's guilty. No, no, wait. I don't know what you're talking about. Either of you. Leave me alone. I don't know him. I never did know him. There. You see? You forced me to say it. He said I would. You forced me to. You did. You did. Matter with that man? He ran off, crying. A big grown man crying. I don't understand. But the one inside, what will they do with him? Do with him? He'll be on his way to Pontius Pilate now. <laughs> Why have you wakened me so early? If it wasn't important, pilot, I wouldn't have had you roused. This is just as well. There was no sleep for me anyhow. My wife moaning and tossing from a bad dream. Well, now, what do you want? There is a man here upon whom the sentence of death must be passed. Death? What's he done? Blasphemed. Blasphemed? Well, then, it's no affair of mine. Even if he claims to be king here, there's only one king. Caesar is his name. Oh, this may be serious. We'll have him in. We'll find out about this. Sentry, bring the prisoner in. In here. Well, now, tell me. Are you king here? Well... My kingdom is not of this world. Indeed. One who talks of kingdoms could claim to be a king after all. Well, do you? Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Witness unto the truth? What is truth? Why don't you answer me? Don't you know that I have the power to have you crucified? You could have no power at all against me, except it was given you from above. Indeed. Sentry, take him out of here. This way, King. Strange. Strange man. And what is your decision about him, this pretender to thrones? Oh, he talked of his king. Pilot. Yes. Claudia, what are you doing here? Pilot, I heard you talk to him. Please, my dear, this is no matter for you to worry about. I have nothing to do with that just man. I have dreamed about him. And my dreams trouble me. Trouble me. So that's why you tossed and moaned so in your sleep. Pilot, this is no time for concern with dreams. This is a time for realities. What are you going to do about him? Pilot, please, have nothing to do with him. Remember, Pilot, word of this will reach Rome. I see no fault in him. Yet, word of a king reaching Rome. Wait, I know. There's a way out. The custom to release one prisoner to the people at holiday time. I shall offer this man and one other. Let the crowd make the choice. But let it be taken out of my hands. 
This is the voice of truth. The voice of God's ever, absolute, eternal, unbroken, verbally inspired word. The voice of truth is coming to you from the Metropolitan Tabernacle, 501 Opelousas Avenue, New Orleans, Louisiana. This is Pastor Albert Pendarva speaking, inviting you to stay tuned to hear God's message by our late pastor, L.R. Shelton Sr., on the subject, The Salvation of Lydia, and this is number 191 in this series. That's The Salvation of Lydia, number 191 in this series. With your Bibles in hand, let's read, will you? All right. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside, where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women, which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, we have heard us whose heart the Lord opened. I want you to get those words. Whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house, and abide there. And she constrained. In the salvation of Lydia, as recorded here in this scripture, now you listen. Now some of you are not listening. Now you lay down those pots and pans there in that broom and you get still, will you? Now you didn't get that statement. In the salvation of Lydia, as recorded here in this scripture, and in every case, as given in God's word, where God saved a sinner, you will find a direct operation of the Holy Spirit upon the mind and heart of every true convert. The Holy Spirit writes the laws of God upon the mind and in the heart of every individual he saves, according to Hebrews 8.10. All right, let's read it. <laughs> and this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in then their hearts. Now that's exactly what God does to every sinner he saves. He writes the laws of God upon their minds, upon their hearts. And that individual never gets away from two things. First, what he is by nature, what a sinner he is, and second, what a savior Christ is. Now you get that and hold it. We find from the study of God's study of God's word that there are two distinct modes of operation by which the Holy Spirit carries into effect his great design in the salvation of a lost soul. Now you listen. <coughs> in the first place, his operation is external. This we call this we call the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Let me repeat. This is the external operation of the Holy Spirit and has to do with the outward manifestations of the Holy Spirit. The other one is internal. This is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of true believers. The internal work of the Holy Spirit in the mind and heart of the sinner is the enlightening, converting, and sanctifying grace which makes the gospel effectual to the salvation of that sinner. Now, brother, now you listen. If you do not believe 
in the internal work of the Holy Spirit and bringing a sinner to Christ for salvation, I have no message for you. I don't. If you believe that salvation is the individual by his own power making a decision for Christ, and you call that salvation, then you do not believe God's word. And it shows that you are in a state of unbelief. Your mind is darkened. Your understanding has never been enlightened. And you're still in your sins. Now, you say that's a tough statement, preacher, but that's so. Whether you believe it or not, that'll hold water and won't leak a drought. <clears throat> well, now I want you to get this. There's a wide difference between the manifestations of the Spirit, which is external, and the direct operation of the Holy Spirit on the soul, which is internal. The outward manifestations of the Holy Spirit have nothing in the world to do with the salvation of a soul. It is only the direct operation of the Holy Spirit upon the soul that renews and turns it from darkness to light from the power of Satan to the power of God. Salvation is wrought in the heart of the individual by the Holy Spirit using the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is the agent. The Word of God is the instrument or means. There can be no salvation in the heart of an individual apart from the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. All right, now you're quiet, you listen. Now, now get this truth. Now, some of you are going to jump up through the ceiling, but don't you turn that dial. Do I'm afraid that thing will explode in your face and you'll sure go to hell. All right, you listen. The miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit ceased when they had fulfilled their end by establishing the truth. Now, that's so, whether you believe it or not. But his office of quickening and bringing a sinner to Christ has not ceased. I wish I could drive that great truth home to the heart of every one of you. The individual, get it now, the individual who puts the emphasis upon the manifestation of the Spirit or the miraculous gifts of the, of the Spirit never sees souls saved under their ministry. Are you thinking with me? They'll get a lot of decisions, a lot of converts, but no salvation. The manifestation of the Spirit as an evidence, is not enough to bring a sinner to Christ. You let that truth sink deep in your heart, and don't you get away from it. Now I'll go a little bit further. The verbal, the verbally inspired Bible is not enough to bring a sinner to Christ apart from the Holy Spirit. Now I know a lot of folks believe that, that the Word itself will bring sinners to Christ without the Holy Spirit, but it won't do it. Now, you let that soak in, and I'll go a little bit further. A faithful ministry, one who preaches the truth of God's Word, is not enough to bring a sinner to Christ. Why? Because there is in the heart of every individual a spirit of unbelief, enmity against God, a lofty imagination, which nothing but the Holy, the Holy Spirit himself can overcome and bring that sinner from darkness unto light, from the power of Satan unto God. And this he does by the Word. The Holy Spirit, apart from the Word of God, cannot bring the sinner to Christ. And the Word of God, apart from the Holy Spirit, never converted a soul. Never had. Never will. <coughs> it takes the Holy Spirit as the agent, the Word of God as the instrument. And the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and, and writes the laws of God in that mind and upon that soul. In our scripture lesson today about the salvation of Lydia, we find the most beautiful illustration of the direct personal operation of the Holy Spirit upon the soul of Lydia in her salvation. I want you to notice that expression in the 14th verse. The Lord opened her heart. The word Lord there refers to the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit begins to deal with a sinner for salvation, he is Lord. And every one of you sinners out there, I recognize that thing too. He's Lord. That he is sovereign. 
if the Holy Spirit opened our heart, and he did, therefore it was closed against the gospel until he opened it to the word of God. Because the scripture says she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. That is, she listened to the word of God. And the Holy Spirit took the word, opened her heart, and brought her to Christ. That's the way she was saved. Now, in the first place, as we study this illustration of God's sovereign saving grace, let's notice Lydia's state and character before she was saved. It is in contrast to the malefactor's character. <coughs> he was a robber, a thief, and a liar, and everything else. But Lydia was a proselyte to the Jewish faith, that she was a believer in the only true and living God. Just when she had been converted to the Jewish faith, we do not know, or under what circumstances, but she'd come to see that the God of the Jews was the true and living God, and she accepted the light that she had, and believed and walked in it, because it says here she worshipped God. She was a Gentile by birth, a native of Thyatira, which is located in Asia Minor. She had come to the city of Philippi, to sell purple. After setting up a place of business, she soon found a group of women who were like-minded in religious matters. She was a stranger amidst the idolatry, but she lived up to her religion and did not hesitate to gather with others to worship God. This was a group of Jewish women who were gathered by the riverside in an open-air prayer meeting. There was no synagogue in Philippi as all the Jews had been given orders to leave the city. Lydia was a very religious woman, and she was not ashamed of her religion. She conformed to the law of Moses, in that on the Sabbath day, she went out of the city by the riverside, where prayer was wont to be made. In other words, she attached herself to a group of devout women at an Oakmere prayer meeting. She was a businesswoman, upright, and was very devout, and had deep convictions regarding things religiously. But in spite of all of our religion, her life of prayer and devotion, her heart was, was closed to the gospel. <clears throat> How many of you folks out there in Radio Land whose heart are exposed to the gospel? You're very gospel, you're very religious. You may be a member of this church or that church or some other church. Very devoted but your heart is closed to the gospel. You do not know Christ. All right? This reminds you of Cornelius in the 10th chapter of Acts, who was also a devout man who prayed always. I've heard some folks say that God doesn't hear the prayer of a sinner. God does hear the prayer of a sinner. My friend, if that sinner is living up to the light he has, then the cry of that sinner's heart is for more light. I believe that was true with Lydia. What a blessing to a home where there's family order, where prayer is wont to be made. There's just something about bringing up children in the atmosphere of prayer and Bible reading that they never get anywhere else. Do you know that? And I, I wish there is a family order in every home where this message is going. Listen, man, do you gather your family together for prayer? Well, you said, I'm not saved. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> Lydia wasn't either. But you'll find, if you'll read close to that, her household was saved with her. And bless your heart, my friend, you have a promise. If you'll just take it over there in God's Word, that you can clean for your household. But we face this fact, apart from the operation of the Holy Spirit, Lydia would never have heard the gospel message. Do you know that an individual can sit under the gospel for years and never hear? They never will until the Holy Spirit opens our heart. This is because the whole moral nature of man, including his understanding, his conscience, his will, and his affections, is depraved, and the heart is closed against the reception of the truth. Every faculty of Lydia's being was closed against the truth of God's Word, and only divine grace could remove the obstacles in the way. All hearts are naturally shut and made fast against Christ. Old Martin Luther realized that 
that every heart is closed against the gospel and said on one occasion, I was obliged almost to knock my Bible against their head to send it into their hearts. I feel like sometimes taking a pole and beating the fellow over the fellow over the head if I get the truth into their hearts. But I can't do it. Christ said he came under his own, and his own received him not. Again he said he would not come unto me that you might have life. Every soul by nature is closed against Christ. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Not every one, not only is every soul by nature closed against Christ and the gospel, but there's a judicial shutting up of the heart against Christ. Now you get this, you listen. I say this because those who have sat long under the light of the gospel and have rebelled against it, you stand in grave danger of this judicial stroke of God. There is no reason in the world, my friend, for you to rebel against God, for a sinner to rebel against the light of the glorious gospel of Christ is to put himself in such a dangerous position of God leaving you alone and leave your heart shut and closed forever against the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I know folks say, well, I can come to Christ when I want to. Well, if I love liars, I'd hug your neck. <coughs> you listen. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and there is no ex excuse in the world for a soul to rebel against God. I know when the Lord opened my heart, and let me see my lost condition. I was literally scared to death, lest I should rebel against the truth. I knew that I was at God's disposal, and if I were ever saved, it would be by his sovereign free grace, administered by a loving Lord, and the only thing God would have to do for me to go to hell was to leave me alone. And I will tell you, my friend, if you don't get anything else, the only thing God has to do for you to go to hell is to leave me hell is to leave you alone. I was so afraid. He had said to me as he said of Ephraim, let him alone. He's joined to his idols. The only reason a sinner rebels against God is because he is joined to his idols and does not want to give them up. At the close of a service last Sunday, someone went out of this service saying, that preacher will never make me bend unto Christ. You know what I said? I sent him word to go to hell for his trouble. I didn't, I, I couldn't bend him. And God, the only thing God has to do to let you alone, and then he would judicially shut your heart against the gospel never to be opened this side of hell. Now you get that thing. <clears throat> the natural heart is so closed against the gospel message until it will not receive the things of the Spirit of God. The conscience is seared with a hot iron. The very mind and conscience is defiled, and the heart is harder than stone. There is nothing that can open that heart but the Spirit of the living God. The iron bar of divine law cannot prize it open. You can preach to that heart. You can preach to that heart. The soul is in it. It shall die and lay bare the very vortex of hell before the eyes of that soul, and it would never be open to the gospel of mercy. It would deliberately choose death and hell against Christ and salvation. The golden key of free grace cannot open it, no matter how much you may picture the remission of sins in Christ. To that individual, that heart would remain closed forever. The works of providence cannot open it. The Lord God could remove every member of your family by death, and that heart would still be in bitterness against God. God can bless that individual with all temporal blessings and blessings, and he had turned on God with all the enmity of hell. The mercy mercies of God cannot open that heart, no matter how much you may picture Christ dying for sinners and live before that individual the tender mercies of a loving God. That heart would remain closed against the love of God. So we behold here the dismal state of nature and the woeful condition of all unregenerate souls. The heart in itself, by nature, is harder than a stone and can never be opened except by the Spirit of the living God. Then there are many obstacles which construct 
obstruct the entrance of truth into the heart of a sinner, which can only be removed by the operation of the Holy Spirit. There is ignorance. The sinner will hear the word, but does not understand it, because his understanding is darkened and the gospel is hid from him. Then there is unbelief. The sinner rejects the testimony of God. He revolts against the word of God and will not believe it. Then there is the bar of enmity. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It hates God for no reason in the world. It didn't say the carnal mind is at enmity against God, nor is an enemy of God. But it says the carnal mind is enmity. Therefore, it can never be changed. Then there is the bar of pride. The wicked, because of his pride, will not seek after God. Then there is the bar of discouragement and despair. The sinner says there's no hope. So convinced by Satan, there is no hope. He's led or driven to despair. And many will commit suicide before they'll turn to Christ for salvation. Then there's the bar of unwillingness. Christ said, ye will not come to me. Then there's the bar of worldly, mind, worldly mindedness, the kindedness, the cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, choke the word. It becometh unfruitful. And there's the bar of sloth, a little more sleep, a little more slumber, and the folding of hands to sleep. Some of you sinners are, sleep, are sleeping your way in the hell. Yes, you are. You care not about your soul's redemption. Then there is the bar of vicious passion and depraved habits. Light hath come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So we see from every angle the heart is barred against God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit has to remove these bars one by one to lead that individual to Christ. There's also the bar of prejudice. How many have, have to come over prejudice against the truth? Prejudice against, against the name under which I or others preach before you can get to Christ. Just because I care the name Baptist, just a lot of you folks are prejudiced against the truth I preach. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And a lot of you Baptists, uh, because I, I preach the truth, you're prejudiced against me. Because, because you've been told, or oh, he's not the kind of Baptist we are. And therefore you are prejudiced and you close your mind against the truth. Many of you preachers will listen to me, do you? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. These bars are too strong for any but the power of Almighty God to remove a break. But thank God he can break with them because the scripture says the Lord opened Lydia's heart. If the Holy Spirit brooding over this Jewish convert could open her darkened heart of unbelief and enmity against God, and overcome all prejudice and bring this individual to Christ, a wicked sinner, you need never despair. Thank God that's so. <laughs> Even though Lydia was sincere and devout worshiper of the true God, her heart was thus shut against the truth, and it took the light of the grace of God by the power of the Holy Spirit to open her heart to the gospel. Yes, she saw as God opened her heart. Her sin, her corruption, her violence, her wickedness, her heart, her hardened heart. She saw what a mass of corruption in the sight of God. She was caused to meditate upon her sin. She was brought face to face with the awful, woeful condition of her wicked heart. Yes, she had to be. Every sinner has to face that thing or go to hell. Listen, you know, I, I hear folks say, Oh, I want to be saved. I want Christ. And they don't mean a word of it. Here's an individual that said, Pray for me. I want to be saved. I want to know Christ. And then that individual can flippantly make a date for a supper. That individual doesn't want to be saved. And I doubt it's ever been brought on the Holy Spirit conviction. An individual tells me they want to be saved and they want Christ. And I see them taken up with things of this life. I know they're lying. They're covering up. The Bible says, and does not lie, the soul that wants Christ will so seek him first, last, and always. 
Christ said, if you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. No heart can truly be open to Christ that is not willing to receive him with his cross of suffering and his yoke of obedience. You must be willing to become identified with Christ. If you're not willing to become identified with Christ in his suffering and shame, you can never receive his person. Every heart that opens to Christ is first visited with a deep humility and a sense of its emptiness and unworthiness. All self-righteousness is given up as dumb and dross, and that individual comes to the death to detest sin and hate sin until it's willing to turn in a loose. Now listen, friends. You must receive Christ into a naked, unworthy soul, or you'll never know him. You cannot come to Christ with one hand and bring your lover with the other. Now, a lot of you young people are trying to get saved, and you tell me you want to be saved, and you're trying to come to Christ with one hand and drag an ungodly lover with another, and you can't do it. A poor sinner will either come naked and empty-handed, as Christ is not on sale, but as a gift to God. And God never gives Christ to any heart that doesn't want him above everything else. And you put that thing down holy. Now, God never gives Christ to any soul that doesn't want him above everything else. Why should he? he? Why should God give his son to a sinner that doesn't want him more than you want your sweetheart? More than you want your sins. And more than you want anything else in the world. I know, my friend, when I came to him, I came to him as a naked soul. I came to him as an empty blank. I came, I wanted Christ more than I wanted my family, more than I wanted my job, more than I wanted something to eat, more than I wanted anything in the world. I forgot about hell. I forgot about judgment. That has passed. I knew I was condemned to die. I knew I was on the road to hell. I knew that. The pains of death had seized hold my soul. But I came to the place where I wanted Christ. I wanted him. I wanted him. I wanted him in the morning. I wanted him at night. I wanted him when I wanted my wife. When I wanted my children, my family. When I wanted this church or anything in the world. And one day God gave him to me revealed into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Poor benighted sinner. Poor wretched sinner. Poor to hell deserving sinner. If the Holy Spirit's open your heart, don't you fight him. This brings to the close another broadcast of The Voice of Truth. And we want to remember, remind you that the message you heard was Salvation of Lydia, number 191. You may order a free printed, printed copy. Our mailing address is Radio Missions, Post Office Box 6250, New Orleans, Louisiana, 70174. This is Pastor Albert Pendorfer saying, May the Lord's richest blessings rest upon you. This is the Voice of Truth broadcast.
of the power of hell upon the people of Jesus Christ. Thou hast no those that would resist and divide and the forces of evangelical Protestantism and seek to line up with the enemies of God against those that seek to fight the Lord's battles. But we bless thee that through good report and ill report we can press on with the battle, knowing that the God of truth shall honor those that honor him, and knowing that the God of truth shall preserve the right and bring down the forces of darkness and the forces of hell. Father, we pray that this night we pray that thou wouldst touch us with the mighty power of God the Holy Ghost. We need divine power to fight this battle against ecumenism and against popery. We need our God and Father, the strength that is from heaven. Our being is the arm of the day, and being are all that trust in carnal weapons. And in carnal things, we thank thee that we can put our trust and our faith again in the Lord Jesus Christ, the great King and Head of the Church. We thank thee that his truth shall prevail, that light shall dispel the darkness, that the forces of Christ shall defeat the forces of Antichrist, and that we shall see in our day a great and blessed reviving of thy work. Now as we set before this people the issues of our day, and as we take our stand in this house for the everlasting truths of the everlasting gospel, be pleased to honor the work of our hands, that in every part of this province there may be a separated testimony to the power of God, a place where people can go out from the apostasy to serve the Lord in freedom and in the Spirit of the Lord. Oh God, we pray for a great smashing of the chains of apostasy in this land. Open the eyes of thy people. Open the eyes of the Protestants of Ulster. Help them to see that through hegemonism, their heritage is being bartered. Their liberties are being sold. And Lord, may they shake the dust from off their feet and come out and join with us in this battle that we may stand together in the name of the Lord of hosts. We thank thee that thou didst bless the reformers as they fought this battle in the 16th century. Thou didst bless the covenanters as they re-fought this battle in the era of the Puritans. And thou wilt bless us in the 20th century. For God is still the same. And he has not changed God ever will. And his truth shall prevail. And his word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Oh God, come down upon us as a people. God bless the true church of Christ to the ends of the earth. And grant today she may put on her beautiful garments, that Zion once again will be rebuilt, that the wilderness shall blossom like the rose, that God shall bless his people for Christ's sake. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. You say to me, Mr. Peasley, why are you a prophet? I am a Protestant tonight because I totally and utterly reject the mockery of the Mass. And I reaffirm and rely for my salvation on the sacrifice of God's dear Son. Let me repeat. I totally and utterly reject and repudiate the mockery of the Mass. And I reaffirm and rely for my salvation on the sacrifice of the Son. What does Rome teach 
of like a man. Her teaching is summed up in the creed of Pope Pius IV, which is the summary of the Council of Trent's decree. And of course, Rome to this day tells us through the voice of Cardinal Heenan that she hasn't departed one iota from the doctrines of the Council of Trent. Let me read. That in the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist, there is truly, really, and substantially the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that there is near the conversion of the whole substance of the bread into the body and the whole substance of the wine into the blood. Which conversion the Catholic Church calls transubstantiation. I also confess that under each kind of law, Christ is received whole and entire and the true sacrament. So when the wafer is elevated upon the altar, it becomes the body and the bone and the blood and the nerves, and the sinews, and the whole humanity, and whole deity of Jesus Christ. It becomes God. I have in my hand a textbook that every priest of Rome must study before they are ordained. It is called The Dignity and Duty of the Priest. It's one of Liguri's, St. Liguri's works. And in this work, this is what he says. The priesthood are superior to the Virgin Mary. She conceived Jesus Christ only once, but by consecrating the Eucharist, the priest, as it were, conceives him as often as he wishes, so that if the person of the Redeemer had not yet been in the world, the priest, by pronouncing the words of consecration, would produce this great person of a man God. Thus the priest may in a certain manner be called the creator of his creator. Since by saying the words of consecration, he creates, as it were, Jesus in the sacrament. By giving him a sacramental existence and produces him as a victim to be offered to the Eternal Father. As in creating the world, it was sufficient for God to say, Let it be me, and it was me. So the priests, when they say, Let God be made, he is made in the wafer of the sacrament. It is lies and the darkness and salt that ever was devised by Satan to insult the blessed Satan. My friend, I have a mass book here in the pulpit. And in the mass, every time the wafer is exalted and I read, after pronouncing the words of consecration, the priest kneeling adores the sacred host. Rising, he elevates it. Look up at the sacred host with the piety and love, saying, My Lord and my God. And here is a note. The faithful who at holy mass, at the moment of the raising of the holy host, or the exposition of the same, shall devotely utter the above invocation, My Lord and my God, contain an indulgence for seven years from the flames of purgatory. The Mass, utter blessed. And I say from this pulpit tonight, that when the Protestant churches of this land are prepared to accept as Christian ministers the mass agent agents of the Roman Catholic Church, then they have sold the doctrines of the gospel to the devil. Let me make it clear. And let me say from this pulpit this evening that we must raise our voice in this day and cry aloud against this unholy thing. I'm glad that I can come tonight to the Word of God. How refreshing it is to turn from the idolatry of Rome and I read to you a passage in Scripture. And if you look at it with me just for a moment, you will see the great contrast. Hebrews chapter 10. 
And what does it say in verse 12 and 13? But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be me of his footstool. I want to ask three questions. What man, what has he done? Where is he now? What man? This man! Take the book of Hebrews, friend. Get it in your hand. The book of Hebrews is a book, a book that has a keynote better than, better than, better than, greater than. Turn to the first chapter of Hebrews, and you'll find in that chapter Christ is greater than angels. Turn to the second chapter and you'll find he's greater than Adam. Turn to the third chapter and you'll find he's greater than Moses. Turn to the fourth chapter and you'll find he's greater than Joshua. Turn to the fifth chapter and you'll find he's greater than Aaron. Turn to the sixth chapter and you will find that he's like to Melchizedek. Turn to the seventh chapter, and you will find he is greater than the Levitical priesthood. Turn to the eighth chapter, and you will find he is better than the covenants of works. Turn to the ninth chapter, and you will find he is better than the tabernacle. Turn to the tenth chapter, and you will find he is better than the law. Turn to the eleventh chapter, and you will find he is better of the Old Testament saints. Turn to the twelfth and thirteenth chapters and you will find these greater than the commotions of time or the changes that shall take place upon this earth. What man? A man that's greater than Adam. A man that's greater than Moses. A man that's greater than Joshua. A man that's greater than the Levitical priesthood. A man that's greater than the covenant of works. A man that's greater than the law. A man that's greater than the tabernacle. A man that's greater than any Old Testament saint or New Testament saints. What man? The second man. The Lord from heaven. That's who we worship in this church. The Lord from heaven. Born of a pure virgin. His life was a miracle. He had a supernatural entrance to the world. And a supernatural exit from the world. He lay in a virgin womb, and in death he lay in a virgin tomb. My blessed Savior. There's none like him! Let me tell you, dear friend, tonight, salvation is not in the church. Oh, that I could pump up this today in this age of ecumenism. Oh, that I could let them know that salvation is not in any church, or in any sacrament, or in any ordinance. Salvation's in this man, this blessed man of Calvary. Wonderful Jesus, I love him with all my heart. He has saved my soul. He has redeemed me from all iniquity. He has kept me for years. He has blessed me ten thousand times over. And I love him with all my heart. And when I see him ridiculed and blasphemed and a weeper, I must stand up for Jesus. And this church is going to stand up for Jesus. And we are going to have no truck with ecumenism. We never have. And please, God, we never will. When I say, if ever there comes up these pulpit snares, a man who would dare to compromise the stand of this church, let God Almighty put his anathema on him. And let this building be burned. And let its testimony cease rather than that this building should ever be used for the cause of anything but the exaltation of the name of Jesus. We preach Christ crucified. And any other gospel is a gospel born of hell, and upon it is stamped that it was manufactured in the pit. Yes, sir. This man, the Lord from heaven, who will you have tonight the wafer on the altar? The reserved sacrament on the altar that Professor Boyd preached with or the blessed Savior. On Christ, the solid rock, we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. 
And these Irish Presbyterian ministers and Methodist clergymen and Church of Ireland rectors, they need to be rectified. They would all take us back to Rome. Well, we're not going. We're not going. You can go if you want, but we will not go. Our fathers brought us away from this thing, said the great Protestant Archbishop of Liverpool, Bishop J.C. Ryle. Let the Israelite return to Egyptian bondage. Let the soul that was washed return to the wallowing in the mire. Let the dog return and eat its vomit. But let no British subject with brains between his ears ever return to the darkness of rumory or the thaldom of Catholicism. May God help us to stand there. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a most unpopular way. But may God help us to stand there. Can I ask another question? What did he do? Have a look at it. This man having offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Three things about the sacrifice of Christ. It's historicity. Look at it. It says, after having offered past tense it's in history, it's not repeated today. It's an act of history. Look at the singularity. It's the one sacrifice. Look at its finality. It's forever. Hallelujah. Forever. And I say to you, when Jesus died on the cross, he made every other sacrificial priest redundant. He put them on the unemployment exchange. They're no use. They have no job to do. Jesus did the job on Calvary's cross. What did he do? With thorns upon his brow, and his back running rivers of blood, hands spiked to Calvary, and feet kneeled to the cross, in the agony of three lonely hours amidst the darkness, as the sun hung its head in shame, as the creator of man died at the hands of his creature. And as this earth convulsed in earthquakes under that terrible load, Jesus Christ did something. He paid the price of our redemption. He satisfied, as the confession of Thea says, divine justice. With one breath, tremendous draft, he drank for his people damnation dry. Praise God, it's done tonight. Finished forevermore. Then he had spilled the last drop of his blood. His heart was broken and calloused. He cried with a loud voice. It wasn't the cry of a dying man in defeat. It was the cry of a God-man in victory. It is finished! Praise God, it's finished forevermore. And I have come as a sinner, a guilty sinner, a lost sinner, a hell-deserving sinner. Fit only to be burned in hell and judged of Almighty God. And I have come and I have put my hands upon the Savior. And I washed in His precious blood. And praise God, tonight I'm as sure of heaven as if I was there. Yes. I've got the witness in my heart that I'm a child of God. My, what a difference between this and the Mass. Was it any wonder the Reformers get away with the Mass and give us Jesus? Away with the wafer and give us the gospel. Away with the owner and give us the Christ. Away with the confessional boxes and give us a priest who can really forgive sins. The Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. Where is he now? According to Monsignor Ryan, he's locked in a box known as a tabernacle. And Monsignor Ryan is the key to it. And every now and again, he condescends to let Jesus out. It would be better locking the priests in the box than letting the Lord out. Think of it. Many years ago, I was in Westminster Cathedral, and I didn't know they were having this blasphemous elevation of the whole ceremony. And I was caught in the middle of all these Roman Catholic worshippers. And I said, well, I must make a protest. You know, you can't. Be a party to such a thing. And so when everybody fell down, I stood on my tiptoes. I'm six foot two and a half. I suppose I'm six six when I stand up. And I stood up. I had a little fellow with me, a Protestant. He was trembling like an aspen leaf. He said, this is terrible, Ian. says, I know we're standing for Jesus. And they all fell down on their faces. And then the priest 
took that with him and he put it into the box and he locked it in. I'll tell you what's more. You know what Rome teaches? Rome teaches that should a mouse eat that sacrament, there is no doubt that God is in the belly of that mouse. That's one of their own theologians, yeah? We may smile, and rightly so, but isn't it terrible blasphemy? And they also teach in their manual for priests that if a priest should be sick and should vomit up the mass, then you must separate the sickness from the wafer and preserve it, for that wafer is Jesus Christ. This is the thing that we're against, friend. This is what we're in opposition to. Away with this talk about gentlemanness and Christianity. Who shall be insulted? Shall my Lord be insulted? Shall he who died on the cross become the playthings of the hands of the priesthood of Rome? Shall we lower the blessed dignity of the Savior and allow our heritage to be sold without a voice of protest or trumpet blast of opposition? Nay, verily, we shall stand for Christ and for his truth. And let me tell you, I'm glad tonight that this thing is coming out into the open. May God drag it more and more into the open. May man and woman see that their churches are no longer the churches of gospel preaching Protestantism, but rather the halfway house in this great movement towards Rome. And let me say something else. I'm glad to know that Romanism is losing her members. I'm glad to know that they're worried about the attendance of the mass. I'm glad to know that in Roman Catholic countries like Italy, the only people that can get to a Mass is a few old women. Thank God their Mass houses are empty. And I pray God that God will give us in the 20th century a Reformation. England left Europe during the Reformation period and cut the bonds of our ties with Europe. And we who have been brought into this common market compromise Thank God we can escape from its meshes once again if God gives us a mighty reformation. And you should go home and pray to Almighty God. And don't despair and say the cause is lost. God's cause is never lost, sir. God's cause always wins. And I'd rather be out in the wilderness with God's cause than in the palace with the devil's cause. For one day the wilderness shall be glad. And it shall blossom as a rose. And I tell you, God has brought this free Presbyterian church to the kingdom for such a time as this. So let us together vow in our places in this house that we are going to love Christ with all our hearts. That we're going to love his cross and his finished work. And we're not going to allow ourselves to be sold to apostasy, to the poor. God has a purpose for this church and a purpose for all our churches. And God says, my people will be willing in the day of my power. Are you a willing people? Are you a ready people? Are you a people prepared, come what may, to stand fast in the liberties wherewith Christ has made us free? And never, never, never be entangled in the yoke of bondage. That's what God's looking for. And if among this people tonight there's some sinner, and you've never looked to that blessed Savior on the cross, you've never put your faith and trust in my feet, oh, come with me to the cross. He is upon his bleeding hand, thorn crowned brow and rhythm side, and the blood that flows from his blessed back. And let me point you to the old wound, for there's hiding there for eternity for you. He's the rock of the ages, cleft for sinners, and in him there is eternal peace. May God seal sinners to life. May God restore backsliders. And if you're in the World Council of Churches, may God help you to shout out and to shout out and to stay up. Yes, may God help you. May you not leave a hoop behind you. Last Sunday night I heard about a dear woman and she went home and she burned her Irish Presbyterian envelopes. She says, not a penny piece to that church anymore. Hallelujah! Go you and do you likewise. That's what it is. You know the reformers, it costs them. I know it will cost you. You've been brought up in the tradition. You remember days when from the pulpit 
Godly man, preach the gospel. Get them over days when your churches were cradles of blessing. I know it's hard for you to leave. I know that. It was hard for Luther to cut loose of the Roman church and Calvin and their apartments. But friend, let's do it for Jesus' sake. Where is Jesus today? He's not in church house. He's not in the Lambeth Palace. He's not in the Vatican. Jesus Christ is outside the camp. Let us therefore go unto him without the camp, bearing his word. And many men and women in this church are going to go with Christ outside the camp. I'll tell you what I want. I want a free Presbyterian church in every village and town of Northern Ireland where the people can go to worship the Lord. That's what I want. I want to see this movement of ours becoming a real crusade for God. A movement baptized with Holy Ghost energy, set on fire with Pentecostal enthusiasm and the oil of the Holy Ghost. And may God do it. And may God bless us. It's an evil day. These are my convictions. This is where I stand. I don't suppose in any other denomination a minister would be permitted to say the things that I have said this night. But that's the purpose of this church. Where man and the freedom of the Holy Ghost can preach the Word of God. This is the story of Margaret Lecoeur. I plead guilty to a shameless affection in the telling, for I am her brother, Father Marshall, a Franciscan. World War I had just ended, and I had returned home for a visit to my parents. I was in the garden admiring some flowers that Maggie had planted when I noticed a stranger approaching. Father Marshall. That's right. I'm Jerry Kenton of the London Times. I understand you were at Eight Statesman's Kerker. Yes, I was there. <laughs> Your newspaper should feel proud of you. You're the first reporter I've found who could even pronounce the place. Belgian, aren't you? That's right. I've talked to Belgian soldiers. I'm on the track of one of the strangest stories to come out of the war. 
I'd like the truth about what happened to you at Aid Station's Gatter. I think you mean what didn't happen to me. I didn't get killed. Is that so unusual? In a spot like Aid Station's Gatter, I think it is. Few remained alive in that hell for more than a week. You survived 18 months in a town raked constantly by crossfire until not a house remained. Except the most obvious target of them all, the one in which you were quartered. Isn't this true? Yes, yes, it's true. What else did you hear? That shells exploded all about you. That soldiers whispered that you led a charmed life. Surely it wasn't just the whispering of the soldiers that brought you here. No. I talked to the censor through whose hands passed every bit of mail to and from the front. He's a skeptic, and yet even he is convinced that there was something supernatural about your deliverance. Well, since that was his job, I can scarcely scold him for reading my mail. Uh, did he tell you how he arrived at such an opinion? Yes, because the same thing that happened to you happened also to each of your two brothers on different fronts. Mm -hmm. My brothers were equally fortunate. Well, if this happened to one man, I could dismiss it as sheer luck. But that such a charm should extend to all three members of a family suggests to me the divine hand of providence. Don't you agree? I agree. You admit yourself a child of providence, but then what's the story? You wouldn't believe me if I told it to you. Why don't you try me and see? Very well. On one condition, that you give me the name of the censor who read my letters. Why do you want that? I'm interested in a man who is ready to accept my deliverance as the work of the supernatural, and yet claims to be a skeptic. Your job is to save souls, mine to get a story. Very well. It's a bargain. Hmm? I must tell you the story of my sister, Maggie, how she lived, what made her tick. If I bore you with incidents that seem irrelevant, I ask your indulgence. To me, everything that she did was another step that led to that final act of self-sacrifice. It began in the Flemish community of Liège, Belgium. But that's where we lived with our parents and our brothers and sisters. And Maggie was still in her teens when a crisis came in our family. Mother took little Maggie into her confidence. Maggie... What are we going to do about your father? He refuses any food, whatever. He's wasting away. I must stay at home and tend to him. You're the breadwinner, Mother. Let me do it. I'm sorry, Maggie, but your father's life is at stake. It's too much responsibility to entrust to a child. You said yourself I'm the apple of his eye. What does that have to do with it? Everything. It means he won't resent me. What do you mean? Does your father resent me? Oh, I don't... I don't think Father realizes it himself, but, Mother, he's been a semi-invalid for years, and he's watched you take over one after another of his responsibilities until he feels there's, there's nothing left. And so he's well, sort of given up. I never dreamed of such a thing. But you could be right. I know I'm right. The doctor says we have to persuade him to eat and, and cheer him up. That's half the battle. Well, he won't eat for me, that's for certain. Yes, I think I'll take the chance. I'm going to leave Father in your hands. I'll make him eat. I'll find a way. I believe you will. Call me at school if I need it. Goodbye, Maggie. And good luck. Goodbye, Mother. What have you got there? A glass of milk. I don't mean for milk. I don't want any. I mean in your other hand. Oh, oh, that. Well, uh, just a newspaper. Uh, oh, but there's a big news, Father, in London. Charing Cross. Oh, but uh, I almost forgot. First, the milk. Blast the milk. Give me the newspaper. Oh, the doctor doesn't want you to read before breakfast, so drink, Papa dear, and then I will read the news. You arouse my curiosity about London, where I lived for 18 years, but you will not satisfy that curiosity until... Until I... you drink the milk, Papa. So drink up and you'll soon find out. All right, give me the milk. I don't want soup. Drink it, Father. I shall not touch a drop. Oh. Oh, Father, now look what you've done. You've spilled it on my dress. What if I did? I told you I didn't want any, didn't I? 
Man, you're crying. I'm, I'm sorry, child. I didn't mean to ruin the dress. If there's anything I can't stand, it's tears. All right, stop crying and I'll take the soup. All right. Only, I don't want any last night, even a spoonful. Maggie really went to work on Father. She provoked laughter with funny stories. She played his favorite songs on the piano while he sang. Shrewdly, she gave him more and more responsibilities. Things he could do. Soon, Father had a new urge to live. You may say this had nothing to do with what followed. But you would be wrong. For Maggie had discovered for the first time the joy of helping others. And this was to become... For her, a way of life. It was the eve of my departure to join the Franciscans when a knock sounded on my door and Maggie came into the room. What's on your mind, Maggie? Tomorrow you leave to become a Franciscan. How does it feel? Oh, it's a strange and happy feeling. As if I'd accomplished something, yet I haven't even started. You've known for a long time just what you wanted, haven't you? Of course. Don't you? No. Mother wants me to become a school teacher like herself. What would you like to do, Maggie? Well, continue my education, although I must confess to no particular purpose. You object to teaching? Well, no, not really. I think I could become very good at it. Except that it doesn't give me the complete satisfaction it should. May I make a suggestion? I wish you would. Perhaps the satisfaction you're looking for is something you must find within yourself. But how? By dedication. A life of self-sacrifice in the service of our people. Education is one need. And if you follow Mother's advice, you can achieve partial fulfillment. But you say yourself, this is not enough. There are many among our people who are sick and poor and need help. I know. And my heart goes out to them. But that's a calling in itself. How can I teach school to please Mama and still help the sick and the poor? Mother raised ten of us by holding three teaching jobs at the same time. She also attended daily mass and helped Father in the furniture factory while it lasted. Mm. If you like, I can tell you a secret. And what is that? There are 24 hours on each day. (laughs) (laughs) So Maggie became a teacher. First in the Congo of Serayin, a notorious suburb. Then in the school of the Sisters of Mary. And... Lastly, in a school of the Benedictine Sisters. In 1913, she joined the Third Order of St. Francis and devoted herself after school hours to errands of charity. Good evening. Father Nicholas has sent me. How are you feeling? <laughs> As you see, not well. And my lungs are... Oh, this room. I'm sorry it's not... Fit to receive visitors. Oh, now I can do something about that. But, well, first, let me bathe your head and arrange your pillow. Uh Uh There. Now, that's better, isn't it? Uh, Much better. Now, where is your scrub pail and soap? In the closet. I'm afraid they haven't been used for some time. Well, they're going to be used right now. In an hour, the room could scarcely have been recognized. She'd brought along clean curtains for the windows and a vase filled with flowers. How does the room look now? Like new. Uh, I wish I could say as much for myself. I fear I'm not long for this world. It's just a question of time. Well, then use every precious moment of it to thank God for his blessing. Blessings? What blessing? Is it not a blessing to be allowed to suffer, even as Christ did for us? I'm afraid I never thought of it like that. Then take this little gift I brought along, especially for you. A crucifix? Oh, I had one once. I don't know whatever became of it. Now look at it whenever you're in pain or torment. See how he was tortured, our poor Savior. Nobody consoled him. How easy it is to endure pain if we offer it up for the love of God. I shall keep the crucifix clutched in my hand. And when I look at him stretched out upon the cross, how then can I complain? (laughs) 
mother kept a keen eye on parish activities. When a particular problem needed solving, she often brought it to Maggie's attention at table. Maggie, Mrs. Hollins wasn't at the sodality meeting last Sunday. I know, Mother. And her husband wasn't with the Holy Name Society. I noticed that. Is it true that she's withdrawn her two daughters from school? Yes, I'm afraid it is, and I know the reason. Why? Because of the way I graded their examination papers. Another girl had the best marks. Mrs. Holland's two daughters finished tied for second. Was that so terrible? No, for anyone else. But Mrs. Holland had set her heart on one of them winning the excellence medal. And she's so disappointed that the entire family has withdrawn from parish activity. Dear me, at a time like this, I know you counted on all of them to be in the procession next Sunday in honor of our blessed lady. Can't we do something about it? Well, perhaps we can. Mother, do you still have the harness we used for the parade horses? I think so. Yes. Those horses have long since gone to their Valhalla. The harness is in the stable. And what about the red plush box your wedding ring came in? The box is somewhere in the sideboard. Well, what on earth do you want of that? And the horse's harness. Oh, it is. It's not the harness itself, Mother. It's the ornamentation. Mother, I have an idea for salving wounded feelings. But promise me you won't tell Mrs. Hollins what I used, will you? It's a promise. But what on earth are you up to? Just trust me, Mother. It's better that you don't know just yet. Good evening, Mrs. Hollins. Yes. I'm your girl's teacher. You're the one who graded the papers. You placed another girl first and my girl tied for second. Well, so I did. The other girl earned the medal, but... Well, actually, I, I, I did you a favor. How do you explain that? Well, suppose your daughter Ernestine had won. Wouldn't Dora have been heartbroken? What? I suppose so. Yes. And if Dora had finished first, wouldn't Ernestine have been filled with disappointment? Oh, that's true, I must admit. Oh, you would have faced a household divided within itself. King Solomon, in all his wisdom, could scarcely have solved such a problem. But the good Lord, in his almighty wisdom, did. Oh, enough of this double talk. It was you who graded the examination. Well, that I, I frankly acknowledge. And it's a fine medal, the girl won who finished first, but no more so than those your daughters won for finishing second. Well, I didn't know that you say my daughters won medal for finishing second. Oh, yes. Well, the margin was so close and your daughter is so deserving that the school board voted unanimously to award them medals also. Well, still, I don't begrudge the other girl a medal as long as mine gets theirs. Uh, would you like to see the medals? Indeed, I would. Well, I, I, I just happened to have them with me. I was on my way to the jewelers to have them suitably engraved. Uh, here, see for yourself. Oh, they're beautiful. And such a lovely plush box. Well, that design on the medals, isn't that the head of a horse? Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, <coughs> it uh, <coughs> symbolizes where uh, your daughter's finished, at the head of the class. Oh, stupid of me. I, I should have realized. Uh, by the way, Mrs. Helen, uh, would you like to have some tea, dear? Oh, yes, thank you. That'd be nice. Good. Uh, um, there are a few other matters I'd like to clear up. There's a procession Sunday, and I, I figured on Mr. Hollins to carry the banner. I wish you'd ask him for me. Ask him? I'll tell him. <laughs> and if you yourself would lead the women, because you you walk so erectly. Oh, I'll be glad to do it. Uh, you know, I missed Ernestine and Dora at school today. Were they ill, perhaps? Uh, a little indisposed, but they'll be in Monday. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear that. They're such good pupils. Maggie was to have still another encounter with the formidable Mrs. Holland. The eldest of her daughters had been married only a few days when Maggie called to congratulate the newlyweds. She was met by an irate Mrs. Holland. My daughter Ernestine married a lazy tramp. Absolutely good for nothing. I'm going to find a decent husband for her, I am. Uh, but, Mrs. Hollins, your daughter is already married. She can't have a different husband now. Oh, can't she? I, I'd just like to see anybody stop her. Mrs. Hollins, they loved each other so much, I'm sure it's, it's just a misunderstanding. 
If you could persuade them to talk it over, everything could be smoothed out. I'll not permit my daughter to speak to him. I'll make it my business to see that she gets a good husband. Now, I, I, I think every mother wants that for her daughter, and I find it hard to believe that you were neglectful in that respect. What do you mean, neglectful? I looked over every prospect she ever dated. Well, I'm sure you did. And you picked George. Well... Maybe I made a mistake. Oh, no, I doubt that very much, Mrs. Holland. You're a smart woman. If George wasn't the best available beau, you wouldn't have approved of him in the first place, now would you? No, I wouldn't. But then why look around now for somebody who could only be second best? But right now she doesn't have anybody. They are separated. Yes, well, you can remedy that. Let her return to her husband. What? And in your name, I I'll look him up and make him promise to treat her right. It's a good idea. Only I ought to be the one to make him promise. Why should you do it? Do you think you can do it better than I? Well, no, no, no it's, it's not that, Mrs. Hollins. But, uh, well, why, why should you go out of your way when it's right on my way home? So it is. Well, go to it. After all, I did pick George, and like you say, there's no reason why Ernestine should settle for second best. Oh. In the home she visited, Maggie's charity took many turns. The first communion suit for a boy, confirmation dress for a girl. Frequently, Maggie solved the problem of money by selling some article of jewelry or clothing. For such purposes, she considered everything in the house as her own. Mother, did you see anything of my shoes? No, dear. Oh, I'm sure I left them beside this chair. Beside the chair, you say? And perhaps you left them too accessible. You mean... I noticed Maggie had a bundle under her arm last night when she left to visit the poor. And you think it contained my shoes? Your shoes and my stockings. Every last pair I own is missing. I had to dig out and mend a pair I discarded. Huh. Maggie is no longer content with giving away everything she owns. Now she borrows from us to help her beloved poor. <laughs> In some cases, she even asked me to make a delivery. And every home I visit, I recognize some article that I used to call my own. Perhaps you ought to speak to Maggie. <laughs> Very well. And I'll tell you in advance exactly what she will say. Dear folks, I'll buy you new shoes and new stockings. And the Lord will bless you a thousandfold. Good morning, Papa and Mama. Good morning, indeed. And what, may I ask, became of my stocking and your father's shoes? Oh, Mother, I meant to tell you. I gave them to the poor. I'm, I'm sure the Lord will bless you a thousandfold. You see? Uh, Maggie, uh, didn't it occur to you that you might have given away the discarded ones we are now wearing? Oh, Father, that would never do. I couldn't insult the poor by giving them something in such wretched condition. Besides, they wouldn't have lasted long. Soon I would have been obliged to search for something newer. Father, really, it was much better to give away the good ones. Then I had the assurance that they'd last a longer period of time. An assurance we certainly didn't have with the ones you left us. Oh, well, they should at least last until we get to church and back. Come, Father, or we'll be late. Then, just a minute. Uh, Maggie, I, uh, I notice your own purse is empty. What will you put on the plate? Oh, I'm sure I'll find a coin somewhere. And, uh... If you don't, what then? Who knows? My dress has silver buttons. But events were happening that were to change the destinies of all of us. On August 7th, 1914, the German army captured the fortress of Liege, and the First World War was on. Soon, three of us were in the bloody struggle. Maggie, I'm so worried about your three brothers. Don't worry, Mother. God will take care of them. We have to think only of the wounded in the hospitals. My brothers will return home safe and sound. How can you speak with such confidence? I have petitioned God that no harm come to them. I am going to offer God a sacrifice. Oh, my Savior... I beg of thee, spare my three brothers. In exchange for their safety, I offer a sacrifice. Myself. 
Maggie had given many things in his name. And now she knew that our Savior had accepted her final gift. The sacrifice of her life. Maggie decided to join the convent. In this way, she could serve God until the final summons and ease the burden of parting from mother and father. Maggie, you're rehearsing your choir to sing a funeral mass. And what's wrong with that? People are dying all the time. But a chorister asked, for whom shall we sing it first? And you answered for me. Well, we must have our little jokes, however grim they may appear to somebody else. You also borrowed from Father Nicholas a book by St. Alphonse. Preparation for this. Mother, haven't you taught me that we should always be prepared? But your personal papers, they used to be in such disorder. And now they're so neat. Mother, sometimes you're hard to figure out. First you scold me because I'm untidy, and now you rebuke me because I'm so neat. It makes me wonder... Why the change? Am I not about to enter the convent? I'm glad you mentioned that. The sisters called to check on your readiness. What shall I tell them? Tell them we shall soon be as one with God. On March 7th, 1916, Maggie became ill. Mother summoned the doctor, who reported a slight fever. When he left, Maggie called Mother. Mother, would you mind combing my hair? Why, surely, child. You act as if you expected to meet a very important person. I do, Mother. She passed away quietly in the arms of our parents. The doctor stuck by his statement that no medical evidence existed upon which to explain her death. On a snowy day, huge crowds attended her funeral. Mrs. Hollins was there with her daughter Ernestine and her husband. Uh, the choir sang the requiem that Maggie had practiced with them. Those whom she had aided frequently visited her grave. Many favors were gained through her intercession. And amidst this sadness at home, one of us, her three brothers, for whom Maggie made the supreme sacrifice. As you know, each of us escaped certain death. God accepts the sacrifice of one and allows others to benefit by it. And that's the story of my sister, Margaret, angel of charity, servant of God. And now, Mr. Kenton, it's time for an accounting. You promised me the name of the censor who read my letters. Very well. You lived up to your half of the bargain, I live up to mine. His name was Jerry Kenton. You... Yes, Father. I was the censor. I'm the skeptic who didn't believe. But I do now, Father. I do now. Magdalene. Hypocrite! You're all hypocrites! So my credit isn't good enough for you. Oh, my money is good enough when I've got it. You hypocrite, take your hands off me! And don't worry, I won't be back. I wouldn't buy a grain of salt from you now. Not one grain. Hypocrite. They're all hypocrites. Oh, this town makes me sick. Mary, what do you want? Nothing. Nothing, really. Have you been well? Fine, I'm fine. Do you need anything? Yes, I need anything. I need money. 
I've run out of money. Lend me some. No, Mary. I will give you food or money for your debts, but no money for wine. That's what you want it for, and you drink. You don't drink like other people do, and it isn't good for you. I knew you'd say no. I don't know why I was stupid enough to ask. Oh, Mary, come home with me. Rest up for a few days and eat some good food. Do you think I'd go back to that place? You're crazy. No, Mary. I will give you food, but no money. You naughty child. You might get drunk and do bad things. And worst of all, you'll embarrass me. You pious hypocrite. Mary, this will get us nowhere. Oh, you'd like to call me names too, wouldn't you? But you're afraid of being vulgar. Go on, Martha. Call me a tramp. That's what I am. Why are you so afraid of the truth? You haven't changed and you never will. Have I ever told you of the shame? The shame of hearing my sister's name become a word on the street? The shame of knowing that Mary Magdalene, my sister, is a prostitute? Oh, my pious sister. Oh, I've had all I can stand. There's no more forgiveness in my heart. You've killed any feeling in me for you. To me, you're dead. I mourn my sister, my sister who died years ago. I can't help you. I cannot even try anymore. Hypocrite! 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 What is the matter with you, girl? Cheer up. Come on, have another drink. You're no good for business if you're sad. Customers get sad, I lose money. Besides, I hate sad faces. I can't stand them. I hate smug faces. Pious faces. Hypocritical faces. I say that to live, you have to get a little dirty. Right. I look life in the eye. And I say, you're not very pretty, life. You don't give what a person thinks you're going to give. But you can sure be a lot of fun. Now you're talking, Mary. Have fun and give a little, too. Get it? (laughs) Here's a lot of fun. Uh, Mary, you know that preacher is in town? Jesus. There's always a crowd around him. There'll be lots of purses just waiting to be parted from their owners. How about it? Lead the way, friend. Lead the way. Hey. Old man. Hmm? Which one is the Nazarene? Oh, there. On the other side of the well. He's back to us. He is the Christ. I hear he works magic. Magic? Oh. Well, I don't understand. Hey, Mary, come here. Mary, keep him busy. The one you're talking to. I'll grab his purse and run. I'm not so sure, Isaac. He's a tired-looking thing. What can he own? I said keep him busy. Go on. Uh, Do as I say. (sighs) Old man, tell me more about your Nazarene. I'd like to hear about his magic tricks. Is it true that he walks over the water? Do not mock him, young woman. He is the Messiah. The son of God. Now, you you don't understand, but you must not make light of him. He does not work magic. He has worked miracles. The sick have been healed by touching the hem of his robe. Because they believe. He has fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fishes. Oh, that must have been a sight. I ask you again, young woman, do not mock him. Laugh at me all you wish. I'm not important. But he's God. His miracles alone are the proof of that. He must be very busy. He is... Here, stop! Stop, see! Stop! That that, that man tried to steal my purse. Oh, now, don't get all excited. Look as if you can afford it. Maybe the thief has to steal. Who knows? 
You know him, don't you? Oh, now, 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 wait. If you're going to make trouble... Well, no harm's been done. The harm may come to you. Now, just a minute. Who do you think you're talking to? Now, forgive me, but I, I know the wrong kind of companions... Wrong kind of companions can lead to trouble. Deep trouble with the soul. Troubled soul can lead to dark and dangerous paths. If you just listen to the voice of Jesus, let him reach you. What are you, anyway? I? Well, at the moment, I feel I'm only a meddlesome old man. My excuse is that, well, quite without meaning to, I, I sometimes talk too much. I can see I hurt you. Please, I, I didn't mean to be unkind. Hurt me? <laughs> Don't be a fool. Well, you're probably a pious old hypocrite, just like everybody else in this town, but... I don't know. For some reason, I like you. Now, don't ask me why. I, I don't know. May I ask you one favor of you? Why? What do you want? Will you help me to make my way through the crowd to the other side of the fountain? I want to see his face. I've traveled so far. I'm a little tired. I, I doubt if I could manage it by myself. Oh, is that all? All right. Here, take my hand. Oh, thank you. Coming through. No. Get, get out of the way, you stupid. Coming through. You know, he made the blind to see. People like me who were blind all their lives but didn't realize now, it. You don't really think that... Oh, you... I saw him bring sight to a man who'd been blind for 20 years. Oh, that must yes. have been something to see. wonder how he did it. No matter. Well, look around you, old man. There's a magic trick for you. That man there, with tears streaming down his face. Uh That's Silas. Now, look at him now. You'd never dream what a crook he is. And there. There's there's Aaron, the wine merchant. He's a cheat. Oh. And and you see that one in the striped robe over there? The one with with the... With the soulful eyes beating his breast? He's one of my best customers. My child, are you so unhappy? Is it because you recognize yourself and these other unfortunates? No, I recognize myself all right, through and through. Well, I've taken you through the crowd as you asked. Now, I've got to go. You're not going. I said I've got to leave you now. Good luck. Goodbye. But God go with you. If he did, he might not like the company I keep. with you anyway. What do you mean? You know what I mean. You know exactly what I mean. No, I I don't. That old man back there. We could have lifted his purse. That's what I mean. So? So, have you all of a sudden gone virtuous or something? Should I stop bringing you trade? I can spread the word, you know. I can... I don't care what you do. Gotten awfully independent, eh? Oh, come on, Mary. So one old man got away. So what? Come on. You need me and I need you. What do you say? All right, Isaac. Let bygones be bygones. You want money. I told you, no more money. And I meant it, Mary. I just want to talk to you, Martha. 
Can I come in? Well, all right, come in. Ah, uh, can I sit down? I'm very weary. Weary? I've been walking all night. I'm not interested in... Please, Martha, please. I didn't come here to fight with you. Don't start one with me. I might deserve it. I probably do deserve it, but... Just let me stay with you a little while. How long has it been since you ate? This morning, I think I don't remember. I'll get you something. That would be very kind. You seem different. I don't know what it is. Are you in trouble? Are you sick? No, I'm not sick. And I'm not in trouble either. And what is it? Did you steal something? Oh, Mary. When I refused you the money, I did... I'll never forgive myself if I brought you to trouble. Never. I was only trying to do oh, the right no, thing. Oh, no, Martha, it's nothing like that. You know, you can be very sweet when you're not trying to show how righteous you are. You said you wanted to talk. What about? Are you sure you're not in some kind of trouble? Trouble? I never said anything about trouble. Why, yes, you did. You did, too. You you said... Oh, well, I don't know what you said exactly. Oh. Oh, I know. You thought the authorities were after me. You thought I was in hiding. You thought... Oh, I don't know what you thought. Don't take that tone with me, Mary. You came here to my home. You came here to me. You only notice I'm alive when you need something. Now what is it? What's the matter? Are you afraid I might be going to prison? Doing more harm to the good name of Martha the Holy Woman? Is that it? Oh, just a minute. Oh, never mind, Martha. Never mind. Whatever it is, I, I couldn't have talked to you about it anyway. You wouldn't understand. There you go again. You're always saying I wouldn't understand. Who do you think you are on top of everything else, Solomon? Oh, don't be a hypocrite! Oh, so that's right. I'm a hypocrite. I forgot. I do my duty. You disgrace me, and I am a hypocrite. Oh, you have the gall to call me anything or tell me anything about your sordid affairs. Oh, sister, I could tell you a lot of things. Well, don't. There are times when you seem... So ugly and so bad that I even feel unclean myself. Oh, so the truth is finally out. Are you satisfied now? Did you get what you wanted? You made me say it. Are you satisfied? Then go on and get out of here. You bet I'll get out of here. Mary, wait. Mary, come back. I didn't want that. I didn't mean to quarrel. Oh, why must everything go wrong? Hello. Hmm? Remember me? Oh. I, uh, I helped you yesterday. Yes, yes. Can I do something for you, child? Well, I just... Never mind, I... I won't bother you. No, wait. Will you join me for breakfast? We'll see if any of the shops are open. It must be quite early. Oh, never mind. I, I don't know why I looked for you anyway. Come with me and help me find something to eat. Meanwhile, you can talk to me about whatever is on your mind. Or I'll talk to you. If that doesn't suit you, we can not talk at all. Is that all right? Yeah. Yes, that's all right. <laughs> You take a, a simple orange. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Why, an orange? Oh, there I go again, rambling on. Forgive me. No. You make things seem very nice. Don't things seem nice to you? Well, <gasps> I'm so terribly unhappy. I'm so miserable. And it's your fault. I was all right until you were kind to me. No, I, I don't know what came over me. I even thought that talking to my sister would help. It's so crazy I've been acting. My sister. What a laugh. We just don't get along. Sometimes I... I think that a, a long time ago she could have stopped me. Well, it's too late now. Mm, it's very human to blame others for our miseries. We all do it. I mistrust myself, so I mistrust my neighbor. And I hate myself. Oh, 
There's no end to it if we let it go on. I had a fight with Martha. I I don't feel like fighting with you two. Goodbye. No, wait. Go talk to my sister Martha. You two would get along fine. Where have you been, Mary? Mary, I've got a lot of plans for today. All right, Isaac. Calm down. I had a very tiring night. Well, hand it over. Let go of my arm. Hand it over, I said. Don't start getting smart with me. I said let go of my arm. I'm through, Isaac. I've never held anything back from you. If I did, you stupid fool, I'd own half of this town. And watch your threats. You try anything and you might wake up in an alley. Dead. What? I'm getting out of here. And if you ever come near me again, you'll find out that I'm not bluffing. Do you understand me? Get out of here, then, before I kill you. You sure you're speaking of my sister, Mary? Yes, yes, she... She needs our help, yours, mine. I'm sure that she wants desperately to see him, Jesus. I know that if she does, her life will be changed. Come with me to find her. Jesus will be in this town until this evening. He's dining at the house of a friend. But why are you so concerned with Mary? You hardly know her. My oldest daughter was very much like your sister. She's dead now. But I considered her dead long before. She disgraced me. I hated my child when she needed my love. Because she had no one to turn to, no hope, she took her own life. In Mary, I see my child. I must try to atone. I've heard of this, Nazarene. I don't know. I don't understand these things. He must be a good man. I'll come with you. Mary, are you in there? Please let us in. Let us talk to you. Go away. Go away and leave me alone. Mary, we must talk to you. Please let us in. What do you want? Oh, Mary, Mary, please forgive me for being so hard and so harsh. What are you talking about? Last night you came to me for help. You needed me and I turned away. I'm not very wise. Please give me another chance to help, or or just to listen, if that's what you want. For once in my life, I don't know what to say. I don't understand. When we set out looking for you, we we, we stopped at the tavern. We heard what happened. We were frightened. I had a fight with Isaac. I can never go back, not there. And I don't want to. (gasps) I haven't cried in years. And since I met you, old man, it seems to be all I've done. <laughs> I can't stop. Oh, Mary, let us help you. <laughs> How can you bear to look at me, to touch me? <laughs> Simon told me. He's sure Jesus, Nazarene. <laughs> oh, I don't know how to say it. Oh, Simon, will you talk to her? Mary, he is God. Open your heart to him, your very soul. If you can believe, he will forgive your sins. Banish the devils within you. He can bring you peace, man. Only you'll let him. If he is God, or if he's just very good, he'll be revolted. If he is God, he will strike me dead for my evil. Child, this... There's nothing he does not know. There's no one he does not love. I will take you to him. No. No, Simon. It's better if I go alone. Been in there such a long time. I'm worried. What if he. 
Wait, there's, there's someone coming out. Young man. Yes? Did you see a young woman in the house? She was looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Do you know if she found him? She found him? It was the strangest thing I ever what? saw. What happened? She walked into the room where my master and his guests were getting ready to eat. She stood there just looking at Jesus for the longest time. Yes. Well, go on. She didn't say anything. She didn't say anything. Then she turned to me and she said, I will give you money. Get me a jar of your master's finest oil and his best spices. He's a rich man. He will have the best. I, I was so surprised that I, I went and did as she said. She went right up to Jesus. Right up to him. Please go on. Tell us about the woman. She fell to her knees in front of Jesus, crying. She cried so much that she washed his feet with her tears. Then she dried him off with her hair. Her hair. Then she took the oil and the spices and anointed his head. I never saw anything like that before in my life. Just never. Uh, what happened then? One of the guests complained that the woman had wasted a lot of expensive oil and spices. She should have given it to the poor or something. Then Jesus said to let her alone that she had done a good thing. That the poor will be here a long time, but that he wouldn't be. And then he said that now his body was anointed for burying, and whenever this story is told, it will be like like a memorial to her. I, I tell you what, I never, never saw anything like it. Simon, what did all that mean? It means that Mary is safe now, Martha. She's safe. half hour, the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations have made their facilities available to the National Council of Catholic Men as a public service for the presentation of the Catholic Hour. During the course of our program today, the Right Reverend Monsignor Fulton J. Sheen will deliver the 14th in a series of 16 addresses under the general title, One Lord, One World, and the choir of the Church of the Blessed Sacrament, New York City, under the direction of Warren Foley, will provide the music. now sings the Dies Irae and the Lacrimosa from the Requiem Mass by Mozart.
present the Right Reverend Monsignor Fulton J. Sheen, who addresses the Catholic Hour audience. The title of Monsignor Sheen's talk today is The Sixth Word to the Cross, A Word to Sensationalists. Monsignor Sheen. Friends, one of the most interesting of all irreligious groups is that of the sensationalists. By the sensationalist, we mean those for whom religion must always be dramatic. For those who judge religion by their feelings, rather than by their mind, and by their wills. Religion to them is a tintillation, rather than a sanctification. A feeling good, rather than a being good. A startling overtone rather than a quiet, subdued minor. They accuse the church of doing nothing because it is not doing anything sensational. Just as they might say there is nothing in the papers today because there was no train wreck and no riot and no murder mystery. If, for example, I announced that next Sunday I would broadcast standing on my head in order to symbolize that the world was topsy-turvy, and if in that ecstasy of modernity I called my posture the iambic dithrambic posture, I would have most of the newspaper photographers of New York in the studio next Sunday. Headlines would appear in the papers. Remarkable new symbolism. Father Sheen stands on his head. My radio audience would pick up a thousand percent. But if I announced that next Friday night, good Friday night, I would talk to you on the passion of our blessed Lord, as I shall do. Few would listen. There is nothing so calculated to win modern minds to religion as playing the fool, catering to the gallery, and making salvation dramatic. And these sensationalists of our day had their representatives at the cross, in the person of the Roman soldiers. St. Duke writes of them, And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. These men were not Jews. They were not citizens of conquered Israel. These soldiers were proud legionnaires of Rome's screaming eagles. Why then did they mockingly refer to him on the cross as the king of the Jews. Because in keeping with the spirit of paganism, they thought all gods were national gods. Babylon had its god, the Medes and the Persians had theirs, the Greeks had theirs, and so did the Romans. And the implication was that of all the national gods, none seemed poorer and weaker than the god of Israel, could not save himself from a tree. But there was something more significant still in their mockery. These men were sensationalists. Hence they expected religion to be very dramatic. Just as dramatic as unloosening fetters and turning a cross into a throne. In their eyes, God could justify himself only by doing a stunt, by pandering to their love of excitement. They wanted a life of Christ like Hollywood might do it, with love scenes between Judas and Magdalene. And that is why they asked him to step down from the cross. They wanted an incident which would make them say, Oh, when their eyes saw it, rather than one which would make them say, I believe, when their minds under the grace of God knew it. And all through the ages there have been groups like those sensationalists, who despise the unobtrusive in religion. In the Old Testament, for example, Naaman came to Elias, the prophet, to be cured of leprosy. He expected a dramatic cure, but the man of God told him to go and wash in the Jordan. And in disgust at such a simple, commonplace suggestion, Naaman turned away and left him in rage. Satan, too, believes in the dramatic. One of the temptations on the mount was to suggest that our Lord throw himself down from the pinnacle. Now the sensationalists at the cross 
with their jaded appetites and their sadistic impulses, make the same appeal. Come down from the cross with rosebuds in place of scars, garlands in place of a crown of thorns, and with power instead of sacrifice. That is what they wanted. And just suppose he had come down from that cross unscarred. Would these sensationalists have believed? They probably would have summoned a learned professor from Athens to prove that it was all an illusion. And while these soldiers were asking for something as dramatic as the king of the Jews unloosening his manacles of steel, our blessed Lord answered them in a very simple word. A word which meant... The drama is already over. And the word that he spoke was a very quiet word of triumph. It is finished. And to those soldiers, it must have been just as preposterous as if you came into a theater about 8.30 one evening and while you asked, when is the curtain going up, someone on the stage answered, I'm very sorry. The play is over. The curtain is already rung down. You have missed the show. It is finished. And sensationalists miss divinity for just that reason. The real, true religion is always unspectacular. The foolish virgins go to buy oil for their lamps, and when they come back, they find that the bridegroom has already returned, and the door was closed. It was so undramatic. A beautiful maiden knocks at the door of an inn. And an innkeeper says to her that there is no room. Into a stable she goes, and there a child is born. It was God's entrance into the world. But it was so undramatic. A collector of taxes is seated at a table counting money. And a passerby calls to him and says, Come, follow me. And Matthew became an apostle. It was so undramatic. Three common criminals, at least criminals on the eyes of the Roman law, carry their crosses up a hill. One of them our Lord forgives and receives into paradise. It was so undramatic. Revealed that our Lord was in very truth the Son of God. For as the eternal word, he was now making a report to his heavenly Father that the redemption of man was now finished and the time was right for sending his Holy Spirit into the souls of men to make them children of God. What was so wonderfully created could now be more marvelously regenerated. In the beginning of the world, God saw that it was good and rejoiced. And now the sun sees that it is better and breaks out into a poem of joy. It is perfect. Where sin abounded, grace does more abound. Through all eternity, the Father says to his Son, Thou art my Son. This day have I begotten thee. And now the Son says to the Father, Thou art my Father. This day have I finished it. From now on he can await the Father's rending of the grave on Easter morn in the final proclamation that it was not he who died. It was sin. This word of our Lord's was not the sigh of a sufferer finding relief. It was the word of a divine artist finishing the work his father had given him to do and finishing it at a very early age, about the age of 33. And thus the perfecting of creation by redemption and the restoration to fallen men of the dignity of divine adoption was rendered all the more undramatic because our Lord did not finish his life with an autobiography. Rather, his autobiography was a biography. He did not say, I finished it. 
but rather, it is finished. He is not the subject of the greatest work which was ever wrought on this poor, sinful earth of ours. The servant of Yahweh did not name himself, but rather speaks of the whole program which God wrought through him. Nor is he saying, Thank God that I have not been unsuccessful, or I will be remembered. The it rather than the I closes an autobiography of the Son as if it were a biography written by the Father and the Holy Spirit. Our Lord could not endure the thought of a book entitled My Three Years in Israel. He therefore is not one of the world's great men. We often say that our Lord was a great man. If he were just that, he would not be all that he is. Good and great men never lie. And our Lord said that he was the Son of God. Therefore, he was either the Son of God or he was not a great man. Great men in the worldly sense of the term are always dramatic. As if their works needed some justification, they ring down the curtain of their life with a great I am. They always reveal themselves, but this man on the cross concealed himself, even in death. And a special word, therefore, to all you sensationalists. Salvation is not sensational. Faith is not emotional. The redemption is not dramatic. You can sit in the very shadow of the cross, as did the soldiers, and still miss its meaning. You can justify your refusal to come to God because of scandal, so did the soldiers. For it was an awful scandal that Christ, the Son of God, should swing impotent from a peg. But God comes to you sensationless in the zephyrs not in the thunders. Therefore, look for him in the commonplace. For he is not far from every one of us. In him we live and move and are. As Francis Thompson said, turn but a stone and start a wing. His voice, did we know it, beats at our own clay-shuttered doors. Do you ever remember an evening when the deadening sounds of the world faded away and you found yourself gazing down a new avenue of spiritual yearning? Do you know what that was? That was the voice of God. That was an actual grace. Did you ever feel remorse? A sense of emptiness? A disgust with excesses? Or a wish for inner peace? That was the voice of God. And those of you who may have given up the church for sensationalism may feel during this week and urge to return and to go to confession. That is an actual grace. That is the voice of God. And those of you who have received this little book which we are giving away free, a book called Friends, which we will send to anyone who asks for it, Jew, Protestant, or Catholic, to you who have read it and felt impelled to be more kind to your neighbor, and to your enemy, know you not that it was not the book that so inspired you. It was the voice of God. It was an actual grace. Make this experiment. I care not whether you believe in God or not for the moment, but at your first opportunity, stop in a Catholic church for a visit. Now, if you are not Catholics, and therefore, if you do not believe as we do, 
that our Lord is really and truly present in the Blessed Sacrament. Just go there and sit down for an hour. Make your hour that way, that hour that we ask for every week. And within that hour, you will experience the surpassing peace, the like of which you've never before enjoyed in your life. You probably will ask yourself, as a sensationalist once asked me, when I took him up to the Basilica of the Sacre Coeur in Paris, where we spent the whole night in adoration of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament with about 1,500 other men. What is it, he said, that is in that church? Without voice or argument or thundering demands, you will have an awareness of something before which your whole spirit trembles, a sense of the divine. God walks into your souls with silent step. He comes to us more than we go to him. Every time a channel is made for him, he pours into it his fresh gift of grace. And it is all done so undramatically in prayer, in the sacraments, before the altar, in loving service of fellow men. Never will his coming be just what you will expect. And yet, it never will disappoint. The more we respond to his gentle pressure, the greater will be our freedom. Too long have each and every one of us said, I want to be just myself. Oh, can't we think of anything better than that? How about beginning to be, with the help of God's actual graces, a veritable child of God? God love you. Monsignor Sheen has just delivered an address entitled, The Sixth Word to the Cross, a word to sensationalists. A copy of this talk may be obtained by writing to the National Council of Catholic Men, Washington, D.C., or to the station to which you are now listening. A copy of Monsignor Sheen's little booklet, Friends, will also be sent to anyone who desires it. Next Friday evening, Good Friday, from 10.45 to 11 o'clock p.m., Eastern Wartime, over many of these same stations, Monsignor Sheen will deliver a talk entitled... The seventh word to the cross, a word to pagans. We cordially invite you to listen. And now we invite all those listening to join Monsignor Sheen in offering up this prayer in time of war. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, who in thy mercy hearest the prayers of sinners. Pour forth, we beseech thee, all grace and blessing upon our country and its citizens. We pray in particular for the President, for our Congress, for all our soldiers, for all who defend us in ships whether on the seas or in the skies, for all who are suffering the hardships of war. We pray for all who are in peril or in danger. Bring us all after the troubles of this life into the haven of peace and reunite us all together forever, O oh dear Lord, in thy glorious heavenly kingdom.
invited to listen to the Catholic Hour next Sunday at this same time when Monsignor Sheen will deliver an address entitled Easter. Special music with orchestral accompaniment will be performed by the choir of the Church of the Blessed Sacrament, New York City. Music on today's program was directed by Warren Foley. Your announcer is John Patrick Costello. The National Council of Catholic Men has presented the Catholic Hour through the facilities of the National Broadcasting Company and its independent affiliated stations, which have been made available as a public service and as a contribution to the religious life of America. This is the National Broadcasting Company. cooperation with Fuller Seminary proudly presents the Old Fashioned Revival Hour, a broadcast of the Gospel with Dr. Charles E. Where my 
Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to His sunshine. Come on now, everybody taking part, singing out heartily. Jump right into it now and sing Heavenly Sunshine and turn around and shake hands with as many as possible. All together. Heavenly Lift it up a little faster, Mr. Green, and then all together once more. It was good for a mother's, it was good for a mother's, and it's good enough for me. It's the old-time religion, it's the old-time religion, it's the old-time religion, and it's good enough for me. It was good for Paul and Silas, it was good for Paul and Silas, it was good for Paul and Silas, and it's good enough for me. It's the old-time religion, it's the old-time religion, it's the old-time religion, and it's good enough for me. Makes me love Dr. Fuller, makes me love Honey Fuller, makes me love little Janice Fuller, and it's good enough for me. It's the old-time religion, it's the old-time religion, it's the old-time religion, and it's good enough for me. It will take us all to heaven, it will take us all to heaven, it will take us all to heaven, and it's good enough for me. It's the old-time religion, it's the old-time religion, it's the old-time religion, and it's good enough for me. It was good for the prophet Daniel, it was good for the prophet Daniel, it was good for the prophet Daniel, and it's good enough for me. It's the old-time religion, it's the old-time religion.
It's time again for the letters. Go right ahead. Some letters. Dear friends, I'm sure you will be interested to know that here in Miami, your broadcast is being placed over the air Sunday mornings on the loudspeaker in the band shell in the main park. And it sounds mighty good to hear the gospel singing floating out over the air for all to hear and then the sound gospel preaching. 
Last Sunday, the gas and electric company's employees were working near, and they could hear, too. The other day, I happened to be in one of the railroad stations, and the shoeshine boy had his little radio tuned to your program. People in the station could hear. Yes, people don't have to go to church these days to hear the gospel, but we wish more of them would heed it and also attend church. A lady writes, dear Reverend Fuller, here where we live in Kansas, we are one and a half miles off the rock road and cannot get to church over the muddy roads, so we surely depend on your broadcast every Sunday. I know how you appreciate Daniel, for we have a son in the ministry, too, and he was converted listening to the old-fashioned revival hour, as well as our daughter. She is in child evangelism work. From North Carolina, a man uh, now out of the service of his country writes a good letter. He says, Dear Reverend Fuller, last year I wrote you from Japan, saying that I would like to hear your program there, and you told me where to get it. I picked it up on shortwave from China, and it was so wonderful when I was so far away from home to hear your familiar voice and the good old songs that we sang in the church at home. I also heard you when I was over in Europe, and I guess your program is heard pretty much all over the world. Here at home, in our fire station, we always look forward to hearing you and receive a blessing. May the Lord continue your hour. We like the spirit of it, cheery and feeding. And then this last letter from South Dakota, dear Reverend Fuller. It is 20 years ago since I first listened to your program. I was then a young school teacher on the lone prairies of South Dakota and far away from home. There was no church that I could attend, and I awaited eagerly each Sunday service of yours. Now, I am a mother of five children, still living in South Dakota, and still depending on the old-fashioned revival hour. Although we do not have a church here, we do have a small Sunday school which meets in the rural schoolhouse. As the years go by, I enjoy your preaching of God's word, Mr. Fuller, more and more. And the music and singing is the very best, I think. I listen to you regularly because it is spiritual food for me, and the messages help so much. All of our children are saved, and we are praying that our whole family may become Christian. And that is all I shall have time for today, friends. please and sing one verse in chorus of number 50. God will take care of you. Be not dismayed, whatever betide, God will take care of you. 
Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Remain standing for word of prayer. Thank thee, Heavenly Father, for thy gracious promise which says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age, and that all things do work together for good to those that are the called ones, to those that love thee. All things work together for good. And we thank thee that surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, all through thy wonderful, amazing grace. Save souls today. Comfort the hearts of those that are discouraged. 
Put thy loving arms underneath those that are sick and ill and bind us together in these closing, difficult, perilous days. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. to the Old Fashioned Revival Hour with Dr. Charles E. Fuller. His message today is titled, The Breastplate of Righteousness. Open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 14, as we rejoin the broadcast. I'll provide additional information on how to get in touch with us after Dr. Fuller's message. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing crew. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, oh, no, I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Just over in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise bring back from heaven's shore, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh, no, oh, I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh, no, oh, I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, 
God, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. Please open your Bibles to the sixth chapter of Ephesians, verse 14, the latter part of that verse. The blessed breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. And may we sit together in heavenly places, and as we sit together around the Word, will you pray wherever you are, fellow believer, that the Holy Spirit may take the Word in an unusual way today and sink it into the hearts of those outside of Christ and bring conviction and bring them to a saving knowledge of the Lord. I have no other ambition than to see souls saved. These words were given to a little band of born-again believers in the great and prosperous but very wicked city of Ephesus. The glad tidings of the gospel have been proclaimed by God's faithful ambassador, but of the many who heard a little group believed, received the word of God with gladness, answering the voice of redeeming love, then confess their faith in the redeeming blood of the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Their confession of faith, however, compelled their separation from many of their old acquaintances and fellowships and attachments. The forces, once friendly, now became their deadly enemies. They wrestled not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world system, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Thus confronted by overwhelming hostilities on every side, Paul exhorts them to stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, and put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Paul, a soldier tried and true, a veteran of many spiritual conflict, and as one who had endured hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, counsels these young converts, these new soldiers, advising them what armor they must wear if they are to be more than conquerors, to be always victorious in the spiritual conflict. Hence the injunction, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now in the Roman army of Paul's day, the breastplate was a piece of armor not only covering the breast, but the back, the neck, and the hips. Perhaps a better understanding might be had if one called this piece of armor a coat of mail. The Roman coat of mail, or breastplate, consisted of small metal plates overlapping one another like a shield upon a shield, wrapping the body with its strong defenses, protecting the vital organs, the heart, the lungs, the back, and the front from every assault of the foe. So in reading verse 14, may we, may I be permitted to read this way. Listen closely. Put on righteousness like a coat of mail. Wear it at all times, your comings and going, and in it meet all the malicious antagonisms of demons and evil men. Fellow soldiers in God's army, We need to put on righteousness, God's righteousness, like a coat of mail. Even our Lord Jesus, the captain of our salvation, clothed himself for in Isaiah 59, 17, we find these words, He, the Lord Jehovah, put on righteousness as a breastplate. If he needed the breastplate, and he is God's righteousness, Surely we, finite, weak as we are, we need to be clothed with the breastplate or coat of mail of righteousness. Two things. This breastplate of righteousness is needed, first, for salvation, and second, for service as soldiers of Jesus Christ. 
All right. It is for our protection. We need to know what kind of material this righteousness is. We need to know when the onslaughts of the evil one come. And they will come. Thirty-seven years have taught me many lessons. And I want to say to you that unless you're clothed upon with the whole armor of God, you will not be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And we want to be sure that our coat of mail is made out of the right material and not out of some substitute, some false or phony material that Satan, the angel of light, is pawning off on all of these bloodless cults and thousands falling for his pernicious way. First, we note a very significant portion of God's Word touching upon this important subject, the breastplate of righteousness. It's found in Philippians 3.10. Listen carefully. Paul speaking. He said, And be found in him, that is, in Christ, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, Note, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now, there are many things that might be brought out in that marvelous verse, but I want you to note among the blessed truths found there just this, that there are two types of righteousness spoken of in that verse. Paul speaks mine own righteousness first, that is, Paul's righteousness, and second, the righteousness of God, or God's righteousness, which is by faith in Christ Jesus. All men, regardless of position, regardless of color, regardless of race, are covered either with their own righteousness, or standing in their own righteousness, or are clothed upon with God's righteousness. There's no middle ground. So, by the way of illustration, let's go back to the opening chapters of Genesis for just a moment. In Genesis 1, 26, we find these words, God speaking, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. How silly! to think that man's come up from the lower animal. God created Adam and Eve in his own likeness. May that sink home. But wait, in Genesis 3, Satan, the old serpent, not our wriggling snake or something, but Satan, the old devil, the serpent, came into the Garden of Eden and Eve and Adam listened to Satan's word, believing the lie over against God's eternal word. And Satan said to Eve, Yea, hath God said, throwing doubt into Eve's mind. And we find in Genesis 3, 7, now note these words, The eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Here is the picture. Created in the image of God, covered with a robe of light and beautiful glory, in perfect relationship and fellowship with God. But the moment that they listened to the voice of the evil one and believed the lie, and substituted the lie over against God's Word. They stood there then in God's presence, having lost that outward covering of, uh, covering of glory, and found themselves naked, not in the realm of the physical. That may be true, but it's a far deeper truth. They found themselves before God without a covering. Naked, before God, alienated, and cut off from the life that is in Christ Jesus. And instinctively they felt their need of a covering, and they began to make themselves 
aprons of fig leaves to be covered and to be acceptable before God. But wait, Adam and Eve sinned, and by one man's disobedient sin entered into the world. And Adam and Eve lost their God-given covering, God's covering of righteousness. And so they proceed immediately to cover themselves with a robe or a covering, the works of their own hands. Now wait, all men by nature that come into this world are by nature children of disobedience, by nature children of wrath, without hope, without God, without Christ, and they stand covered in their own works of righteousness. And Paul speaks of it that he might not be found in his own righteousness, which is of the law, but be found in that righteousness which is of God through faith in Christ. Listen to me, unsaved friend. Be honest now. Deep down in your heart, you're trying by your own good works and own good thoughts, and commendable as they are, you're trying by some effort self-effort to be acceptable before God. But I tell you, it's without hope. For by the works of the law shall no man be justified, and by the works of self-righteousness they'll be of no avail in God's sight. I tell you that on the authority of God's Word. What are you going to do? Listen. May we consider the opening chapters of Romans for just a moment, and I'm giving you a quick bird's eye view of this thing. In the very first chapter of Romans, there are these two verses that are very important. There are four fours. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ first. Second, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Four. Therein, that is in the gospel, now listen, in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And right in the opening chapters of Romans, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in chapter 1, 19 to the end of that chapter, shows first that the Deeply died, deeply ingrained sinner, the scarlet sinner, is without the righteousness of God. And you say to the poor bum, drunken in the gutters of the city, why, of course, he needs God's righteousness. But wait! Turn to the second chapter of Romans. And he says, Thou, therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. And you judge that poor drunken bum as a sinner, a fornicator, a murderer, an adulterer. Yes, he needs the righteousness of God, but but how about you, the moral, the upright, the one uh, the one that's trying to live by the golden rule and observe the Sermon on the Mount? God says you're devoid of the standard of righteousness. And then not to leave any doubt. He goes on in the third chapter, or the latter part of the second chapter, and he says to you, religious sinner, to you who have your name upon the church roll, but are not born again, to you who observe sacraments and bow down before images and follow the beautiful things that appeal to the eye and to the ear, you, unless you're born again, are devoid of the standard of God's righteousness And you are without hope and without God and without Christ. And so he comes to the conclusion. Listen to it. It is very beautiful. Therefore, chapter 320, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh, shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Therefore, By the deeds of self-righteousness, observing the law, and doing the things that you think are right in God's sight, but without being clothed upon with God's standard of righteousness, you shall not be justified in God's sight. Now, 
How to obtain unsaved friend? How to obtain God's covering and have the breastplate, the coat of mail of righteousness? We begin. And in this third chapter of Romans, notice the word. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophet. Here it is. Here is the gospel in all of its glory. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the standard that God sets up. You may be perfect up to 99 and 9 tenths in God's sight, but you'll never reach 100% perfection except in Jesus Christ, and that one-tenth of one percent will put you into the burning lake of fire. It's the acceptance of God's standard robe covering of righteousness, and that righteousness, that covering, can only be obtained by faith in one person alone. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in any church, not in any ceremony, not in any water baptism, not in any observance of any day, not in anything else except Christ, God's Son. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, bring it right down to you. How are you going to obtain it? Listen. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into judgment or condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Acts 16.31, familiar to you believers, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And herein is the heart of the gospel. Christ died for our sins. Christ, the righteous one, died for you, the unrighteous one. He died in your place instead. And I say to you today, accept him, receive him. Then God receives you, and you become clothed upon with the breastplate of righteousness and keep it on. And when you have it on, it'll answer all the accusations of Satan. For who shall be able, according to the eighth of Romans, here it is, who shall separate us from the love of God? Or who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect. If you have on the righteousness of Christ by faith, Satan cannot penetrate that armor. He said, I'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon the Lord. I'm closing two or three minutes early to give time for the word to sink in. And so Paul's prayer was answered he said, not having mine own righteousness, but the righteousness which is of God through faith in Christ. Listen, back in the days of Noah, it's recorded in the word that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And that wicked world, every imagination and evil of their hearts, minds continually evil. God says, I'm sorry I created man. You know what Noah did? He preached. That there was only one covering that would save fallen humanity from the coming flood. And that was to be covered with God's righteousness. God says, my spirit will not always strive with man. And then he told Noah to prepare an ark. And it's beautiful. When the ark was prepared, he said to Noah and his family, come thou into the ark. And be covered and ride above the water. Are you in the ark? Be honest with me. 
If not, why not? God's not willing that you should. But he says, come. Friend outside of Christ in the radio audience, I've just barely touched the fringe of truth in this marvelous verse. God is speaking to you. Kneel where you are and look up into the Father's face and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me for Christ's sake. I'm not willing that you should perish. But I tell you, except ye repent, ye will perish. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And in this splendid visible audience in Long Beach today, how many will put their hands up and say, Pray for me. I need Christ as my personal Savior. Remember me in prayer. Will you put your hand up and say, Brother Fuller, pray for me. I need Christ as my personal Savior. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, sailor boy. Sailor lad, God bless you, young lady. You're on the lower floor. God bless you, another sailor lad. Uh, here's a soldier lad. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you, my dear man. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you here, Marine. On the lower floor, put your hand anyone else and say, pray for me. God bless you, another sailor lad. I need Christ. God bless you. I need Christ as my personal Savior. Remember me in prayer. I want to receive you. Any place, anywhere, anyone else, just before we close, put your hand up and say, Brother Fuller, God bless you, young lady. I, I must close. Continue in prayer. This is Charles E. Fuller bidding you goodbye and God's richest blessing upon you. Eternal Light, a program which comes to you under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Today's program, Some Fascinating Minor Figures in the Bible, is the first in this Eternal Light series of four talks by Maurice Samuel, author and lecturer, based on his book, Certain People of the Book. Mr. Samuel. I must begin by saying that I find this a rather difficult assignment. The difficulty lies in the fact that whenever I read to an audience, visible or invisible, something I've written, I want to make changes as I go along. I suddenly get new ideas, and I'd like to incorporate them in the text. The trouble is, once you've published a book there, the wretched thing is. You may get a chance to make changes in a second edition, but in the third edition you won't like those changes. It goes on like that for the third and fourth editions, if you're lucky enough to get them. And if you're anything like me, the older you grow, the less you like what you've published. So I shall make changes in the text of certain people of the book as I read from it to you. I shall introduce new characters whom I shouldn't have left out. I shall touch up old characters by whom I didn't do right, as it now seems to me. The fact is that as I keep rereading the Bible... I find myself seeing even the most familiar characters in a new light. And I suppose this will go on as long as I live. And if you keep reading and rereading the Bible, you probably have the same experience. One figure that I feel I've slighted, and I can't forgive myself for it, is the prophet Elisha. I don't place him among the major figures. But there was one incident in his busy career that I ought to have treated at greater length. I am referring to Elisha's curing of Naaman and to the role of Gehazi, Elisha's servant. For those of you who are not familiar with the details of that incident, let me condense the relevant part of the Bible text. Naaman, the generalissimo of the Syrian armies, was a leper. It so happened that the Syrians in their raids on Israel, captured a little girl 
whose name we aren't given, and she became the servant of Naaman's wife. This little girl had the temerity to suggest to her mistress that if Naaman went to see Elisha the prophet in Israel, he would find a cure for his leprosy. And so we read, Naaman came with his horses and with his chariots and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come back to thee, and thou shalt be clean. And Naaman was angry and said, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and recover the leper. Anata, Mana, and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the rivers of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? And he went away in a rage. As you see, Naaman was offended because he wasn't treated with the circumstantiality and protocol due to a distinguished patient. He expected something dramatic in keeping with his exalted rank. It was beneath his dignity to accept a simple and untheatrical diagnosis and prescription. Fortunately, there were among Naaman's officers some men of sense who said to him, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he said to thee, Wash and be clean? Well then, Naaman swallowed his pride and followed Elisha's instructions and bathed seven times in the Jordan and his flesh came back like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. Thereupon we read, He returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and stood before him. That is to say, Elisha came out of his house this time. And Naaman said, Behold now, I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore, I pray thee, take a present of thy servant. But Elisha said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And Naaman urged him to take it, but Elisha refused. And Naaman said, If not, yet I pray thee, let there be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth. For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant. When my master, meaning the king of Syria, goes into the house of Rimon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I prostrate myself in the house of Rimon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. And Elisha said to him, Go in peace. Now you have to conjure up the picture. The mighty captain Naaman appears before the humble house of Elisha the prophet. He is surrounded by his horsemen and his chariots, his aides de camp and his staff. And Elisha the prophet sends down a message. Elisha is not impressed. He knows what he has to do and he does it. And the mighty captain rides off with his horsemen and chariots and entourage, offended, and changes his mind and follows the prescription of the prophet and is cured and returns to the prophet in all humility a believer. It is a magnificent story. Incidentally, I hope Hollywood will leave it alone. It is too magnificent for pictorial representation. It has too much spiritual greatness. But there was one man present at the episode who didn't see it that way. That man was, of all people, the servant of the prophet, Gehazi. You would imagine that as a servant of the prophet, he had learned something about spiritual values. No, for we read, But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, said, Behold, my master has spared this Naaman in not receiving at his hands that which he brought, as the Lord liveth. I will surely run after him and take somewhat of him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. And Naaman saw him and alighted from his chariot and said, Is all well? And Gehazi answered, All is well. My master has sent me, saying, uh, There have come to me two men from the hill country of Ephraim, two young men of the sons of the prophets. 
Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of clothes. And Naaman said, Take two talents. And he urged Gehazi and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothes and laid them upon two of his servants. And when they came to the hill, Gehazi took the clothes and talents of silver and let the men go. Then Gehazi went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said to him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And Gehazi answered, Thy servant went no whither. And Elisha said, Is this a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and men servants and maid servants? Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cleave to thee and to thy seed forever. And Gehazi went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. That is the story. The classic Jewish commentaries read into it a lesson against greed, and it is that. But it is much more. It is the portrayal of the utterly irreclaimable moral idiot, the man of impenetrable moral obtuseness. Gehazi had just witnessed an overwhelming manifestation of the prophetic power. He had just seen a proud and powerful heathen converted to a belief in the God of Israel. And what struck him instantaneously was the opportunity it offered of making a fast talent of silver. And you couldn't argue with Gehazi. He knew, of course, that it was wrong in a way to run after Naaman and beg for a present. He misused his master's name. He got the present under false pretenses. But what, he asks, is so terrible about that? Why should that Syrian get away with it? What harm did I do? As a matter of fact, this argument of Gehazi's has been thrown at me, and the reproach has been thrown at Elisha that he was too severe with Gehazi. I haven't known what to answer. I can only say that there are many of us who, if we heard that God was going to reveal his law a second time at Sinai, would apply for the soft drink concessions. Such may properly be described as the sons of Gehazi, to whom Gehazi's leprosy has come down by inheritance. The Bible never mentions Naaman again, and we don't know what happened to him. I've often wondered what went on in his mind when Gehazi caught up with him, and in the name of his master, asked for the talent of silver and the two changes of clothes. Possibly Naaman smiled into his beard and thought, well, well, the great prophet changed his mind pretty quickly. First the grand gesture, no, no, I wouldn't dream of taking anything from you for this miracle. And then the regret, a talent of silver is a talent of silver, and two changes of clothes are two changes of clothes, and every little helps. The possibility that Naaman was driven to such reflections by a miserable little scrounger like Gehazi makes me squirm. Especially that insistence of Naaman's. Take two talents. There may have been a touch of irony in it. I can only hope that I am wrong and that Naaman saw through Gehazi and smiled at him, not at the prophet. Well, this about finishes what I find in the Elisha Gehazi story at the present time. I hope to find more in the future. But I wouldn't like you to think that I consider the Bible to be nothing more than a collection of remarkable stories. No. The Bible has qualities and values of far greater importance. I am only using the stories in these four talks, as Mark Van Doren and I have used it in many other talks, as an introduction to the Bible, from the literary point of view. There are stories for adults, and there are stories for children too. I think that once you become interested in these stories as a beginning, you are led on and on to the other and higher values. Here, for instance, is another story which I have treated in certain people of the book. It is about two women named Shifra and Pua. They were midwives, Jewish midwives, at the time when the Jews, or rather Israelites or Hebrews, were slaves in Egypt, and they saved many Jewish lives. I have come to regard Shifra and Pua as two comical figures imbued with the spirit of goodness. And that may sound strange to you, goodness under the aspect of the comic, but there's nothing disrespectful about it. There are certain types who make a huge joke of foiling evil 
in the midst of danger, who make villains look ridiculous as well as evil. I take the view that laughter is one of the ways of combating evil. Now let me give you the setting of the story. A few generations have passed since Jacob and his clan had settled in Egypt at the invitation of the current Pharaoh. The text tells us that the Israelites were fruitful and increased abundantly and waxed exceedingly mighty and the land was filled with them. That doesn't mean that they filled the land. In fact, we are told that when all the Israelites left Egypt under Moses, there were 600,000 of them, which happens by a striking coincidence to be the number of Jews in Germany when Hitler and the Nazis came to power in Germany. The Nazis were complaining that Germany was full of Jews, although there were over 60 million other inhabitants. The Nazis were also complaining that the Jews had become exceedingly mighty. There may not have been 60 million Egyptians at the time of Moses, but they had the feeling, it seems, that the land was filled with Jews. At any rate, we read in the Bible, there arose a king over Egypt who knew not Joseph. And this king, this pharaoh, said to his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are too mighty for us. Come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and in the event of war, join themselves to our enemies, and fight against us, and get out of the land. And so we read, The Egyptians set taskmasters over the Israelites to afflict them with heavy burdens. But the more the Egyptians afflicted them, the more the Israelites multiplied. The Egyptians made the lives of the Israelites bitter with hard service in mortar and in bricks, and still the Israelites kept multiplying. So population control by means of excessive labor having failed, the king of Egypt bethought himself of another plan. We read, he spoke to the two Hebrew midwives, one of whom was called Shifra and the other Pua, and he said, when you deliver a son to a Hebrew woman, kill him. And when you deliver a daughter, let her live. At this point you might have expected a heroic, death-defying answer from the midwives, far be it from us, O king, followed by martyrdom. You will be disappointed. Shifra and Pua said never a word. They remained silent, and Pharaoh took their silence for consent. And what we read is this, the midwives feared God and did not, as the king commanded them, but saved the men children alive. This went on for some time, and how Shifra and Pua managed, we don't know. Perhaps they bribed a number of officials. But it couldn't go on indefinitely. At a certain point it became obvious that there were large numbers of new Hebrew boys around. And then we read, the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said, Why have you done this thing and saved the men children alive? And the midwife said to Pharaoh, The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, they are very lively, and are delivered before the midwife comes to them. I like to dwell on that answer. The only way I can describe it is as the cheekiest cock and bull story ever offered by professional saboteurs to a deceived government. I like to imagine the bland expression on the faces of those two innocent ladies and the baffled expression on Pharaoh's face. He was completely taken in. He did not even punish the midwives for dereliction of duty or malfeasance in office or whatever the right expression would have been. On the contrary, he allowed them to remain in office because we read and God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty, and it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. We are, incidentally, confronted here with a moral problem. That is, if my reconstruction of the story is a permissible one. May one tell a lie in a good cause? The proper answer seems to be, no, once you tamper with the truth, you spoil the good cause. The classic formulation of the problem is as follows. Suppose a madman with a loaded gun were to ask you where he can find a certain man you know he wants to kill. And suppose you happen to know where that certain man is. What are you supposed to answer? If you say, I don't know, you're telling a lie. The strictly moral answer should be, I won't tell you. In that case, the madman will probably kill you. Perhaps you will be told that the truth is worth dying for. But we have to consider other consequences. 
By telling the truth to that madman, you turn him into a murderer on the spot. I'm afraid it's a highly complicated problem, and I haven't the answer. I might add, not at all in connection with this story, but as a side thought, whenever I hear people speaking of capital punishment, they always speak of the wickedness of killing a human being. They never raise the problem of turning a human being into a killer. Somebody has to be the executioner, whether it's with an axe or by pressing a button, and he is turned into a killer in order to serve justice. He is never mentioned. I have a great affection for the two ladies, Shifra and Pua. They represent to me the unheroic person of saintly character. They don't defy a tyrant. They try instead to fool him. They resort to evasive disobedience. And if there were only enough people like that, we wouldn't need the heroes. Let me close this Shifra Pua episode with an observation on the Pharaoh of the Exodus. In the days of the Tsars, the Jews of Russia used to refer to the Tsar as Pharaoh. A teacher of mine, now long dead, Shmaria Levin, pointed out what a wonderfully apt cognomen that was. Pharaoh kept on promising the Hebrews that he would let them go and kept breaking his promise. The last Russian Tsar, Nicholas II, kept promising freedom to the Russian people and kept breaking his promise. He allowed them to elect a first Duma, a parliament, and dissolved it. He allowed them a second Duma, and he dissolved that too. What happened in the end to Pharaoh and to Nicholas II? They were both drowned in the Red Sea. One was the Red Sea of Waters, which lies between Egypt and Arabia. The other was the Red Sea of Blood shed by the Communists. I am sorry to have to add that this striking and instructive pun couldn't be made in the original language of the Bible. What we call the Red Sea in English is in Hebrew the Yam Suf, the Sea of Reeds, nothing to do with redness. But the parallel between the Pharaohs and the Romanovs is good enough without this pun. There are certain people who, if I may so put it, won't thank you for rescuing them from danger until they've been killed. What I find particularly moving and in a way wryly amusing about Shifra and Pua is that they were not only saving the lives of Israelite children. They were, in effect, trying to save Pharaoh himself by ignoring his monstrous instructions. And when we read that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and we seem to think it is unfair, we should reflect that there are perhaps some people who are quite unteachable, even though God made them. If you like, you may call this a lesson in the patience of the Creator. He tries to remake a man over and over again. The material is recalcitrant, and there's only a certain degree of patience and time which it can expend on this individual. And if the material turns out to have been originally inferior and unmalleable, it goes into the discard. Or as Ibsen used to say, it's sent to the button molder. My third figure in today's readings from certain people of the book is again a woman. She is mentioned in the biblical narrative without a name, and to all but careful readers of the Bible, she is as unknown as Shifra and Pua. I can't say that I find her a likable personality, but she's the center of another important problem which some of you may find interesting. The Bible calls her the wise woman of Abel, and we mustn't confuse the name of the town with the Abel who was killed by his brother Cain. The story centers on this wise woman and a man called Sheba, and we mustn't confuse him with the Queen of Sheba. The incident occurred in the reign of King David. Sheba, the son of Bichri, had raised a rebellion against King David among the northern tribes, and David sent out against him his best remaining general, Joab. Sheba, the son of Bichri, threw himself into the town of Abel, and Joab the general besieged him. It looked as though the struggle would be long and bloody. Well, here was this woman, this wise woman of Abel in the besieged town, and the struggle was on. 
Joab's men we read cast up a mound against the city, and all the people that were with Joab battered the wall to break it down. There were the catapults and the battering rams and the scaling ladders and the twanging of arrows and the yelling of the fighters, and suddenly above it all sounded a woman's voice. It must have been a tremendous voice, a thundering and roaring voice, or perhaps a fiercely shrilling voice. In any case, not the kind of voice that we like in a woman. The voice was so powerful that the fighting stopped, and the wise woman of Abel asked for an audience with Joab the general. And it appears that in spite of that terrifying voice of hers, she was of a peaceful disposition. At any rate, she said so. We are of them, she said, that are peaceable and faithful in Israel. Dost thou seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel? And Joab answered that he did not seek to destroy the city. He only wanted Sheba, the son of Bichri, the rebel against the king. Deliver him only, said Joab, and I will depart from the city. Thereupon the woman said, His head shall be thrown to thee over the wall. And the woman went unto all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and threw it out to Joab. Thereupon Joab disbanded his army, and returned to Jerusalem. We don't know why Sheba, the son of Bichri, headed a revolt. It is possible that he had good cause. We don't know either why, having killed Sheba, the son of Bichri, they decapitated him and threw his head over the wall, making it impossible for him to get a decent burial. But these are peripheral questions. The central question is this. Has a besieged city the right to save itself by surrendering a designated person to the enemy? Is it a moral thing to kill one man in order that many other men, and also women and children, should be saved from death? Never mind whether the man is good or bad, guilty or innocent of a charge brought against him, Sheba ben Bichri wasn't given a trial. He was simply killed to save the city. I've reformulated the problem in extreme terms, and I offer it to you for solution. Suppose you learn that a certain much-frequented bridge had been mined and was going to be blown up at a fixed moment. And suppose you couldn't get to the bridge in time, and you found yourself at a distance of several hundred yards from the bridge. And suppose you had a gun and were a good marksman, and the only way you could frighten the hundreds of walkers on the bridge and get them to run off it was by shooting one or two of them. Ought you to do it? I am assuming that shooting close to them wouldn't be enough. I am assuming that only when they realized that someone was shooting to kill would they run off the bridge. What ought they to do? What ought you to do? The problem seems to be theoretical, but it isn't. It has occurred over and over again in history. It has taken various forms like preventive arrest and four-handed liquidation. Imagine what a difference it would have made to countless millions, including millions of Jews, if a group of foresighted men had killed Hitler and Goering and Goebbels and a few hundred others before they came to power. We are told that freedom of speech may be suspended in the face of clear and present danger. What other laws would be suspended for you if you were the man with the gun and you knew what was going to happen to the people on the bridge? I must tell you that after years of thinking about this problem, I haven't found a satisfactory answer or even a clue to one. In the Jewish traditional commentaries, the problem of Sheba, the son of Bichri, is hotly debated and the discussion hasn't satisfied me. So I leave it to you, with the promise that in my next talk I shall take up a pleasanter theme with pleasanter characters. Characters also better known than the woman of Abel, but like her, women.
just heard the first in this Eternal Light series of four talks by Maurice Samuel, author and lecturer, based on his book, Certain People of the Book, published by Alfred A. Knopf, Incorporated. Be with us again next week for the second program in this Eternal Light series, The Story of Ruth the Moabitess. The Eternal Light is produced under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. This pre-recorded program has been an NBC Public Affairs presentation. This is the NBC Radio Network. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present The Eternal Light a program which comes to you under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Today's program, The Story of Ruth the Moabitess, is the second in this Eternal Light series of four talks by Maurice Samuel, author and lecturer, based on his book, Certain People of the Book. Mr. Samuel. I came to the opinion many years ago that the... Book of Ruth got that name by a copyist's error. It should have been the Book of Naomi. In my opinion, she is the central character, Naomi. I find her more interesting, also more mysterious and attractive than young Ruth, alluring as she is. On a certain day, in the barley harvesting season, more than three thousand years ago, three women stood arguing and weeping on the road that led from a village in the land of Moab to the Jordan and the land of Judah. All three women were widows. The two younger ones were the daughters-in-law of the oldest one, that is to say, the oldest one had lost her husband and the two sons who had been married to the young women. The name of the oldest widow was Naomi and she was a Jewess or Israelite. The names of her widowed daughters-in-law were Ruth and Orpah and they were both Moabitesses. They were not worshippers of the God of Israel. The book of Ruth is one of the shortest in the Bible. It has only four chapters, and the first one reads both like an introduction and an epilogue. We are told how Naomi and her husband Elimelech left the land of Judah in a time of famine and sought refuge in the land of Moab. They and their two sons, their only children, Machlon, and Chilion. And further how Elimelech and Machlon and Chilion died and how the famine had come to an end in Judah and how Naomi wanted to return to her native city. And this is what we read about the argument on the road. And Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go, Return each of you to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Nay, but we will return with thee to thy people. And Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? If I should say, I have hope again to have a husband and also to bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? 
Would you shut yourselves off for them and have no husbands? No, my daughters, it grieves me much for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law farewell, but Ruth clung to her and said, Entreat me not to leave thee and to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest will I die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. These words of Ruth's are among the most famous in secular and sacred literature. We listen to them awed across the interval of 3,000 years. And through the mist of our own tears, we see one returning to her native village and one going with Naomi toward the Jordan and the town of Bethlehem, Judah. When they have vanished from our sight, we remain standing and wondering what was there about Naomi of Bethlehem, the wife of the dead Elimelech and the mother of the dead Machlon and Chilion, that sank so deep into the hearts of the two young Moabite women. And why did neither of them say a single word to hold her back in Moab, though they, for their part, were prepared to follow her into an alien land, and only one of them was finally dissuaded? I have just said that for me there is something mysterious about old Naomi. It is the mystery of goodness and of the power to awaken love in others. There is also mystery in the power to love, but it is inferior to the power of awakening love. I will not go into this question now. I will only ask what made old Naomi so determined to return to her native place that her daughters-in-law did not even try to hold her back. Was she anxious about her old age and afraid of becoming a dependent? No. She knew that as long as her daughters-in-law lived, she would have a love-filled home even if they remarried. Was she suffering from the childhood regression of the old and unhappy? No, she was not the kind to withdraw selfishly from the living into the memory of the dead? Did she want to die among her own and be buried with them? These two Moabite women had become her own, and in the end she would be buried with her own, her husband and her two sons. What then drew her or drove her so resolutely back to Bethlehem in Judah? Perhaps we have a clue in those words. It grieves me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. They are overwhelmingly despondent words. They seem to indicate despair. She wanted to leave her daughters-in-law because she believed that an evil destiny was attached to her and they would share it with her if they went with her. Therefore she told them to turn back. But Ruth would not be deterred. Then we read that when Naomi and Ruth arrived in Bethlehem, all the city was astir concerning them, and the women said, Is this Naomi? And she answered them, Call me not Naomi, which is the Hebrew for pleasant. Call me Mara, that is bitter. For the Lord hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me back home empty. In this first chapter, Naomi is almost like a female Job. And now the two widows, a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, have settled in Bethlehem. How were they going to live? We are told that Naomi had a tiny property left her by her husband Elimelech. But there was no income attached to it. Naomi also had relatives by marriage. One of them, Boaz, was rich and important. Another whose name is discreetly left out was also a man of some means. 
I am ashamed to say that neither of these relatives called on Naomi or inquired after her welfare. They must have known of her return. All the city was astir concerning them. The well-to-do relatives ignored them. Now we read, And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me go into the field and glean among the ears of corn after him in whose eyes I shall find favor. And Naomi said unto her, Go, my daughter. Notice, Naomi did not tell her to go to Boaz's field or the field of the other well-to-do relative. She simply said, Go, my daughter. The widow and the stranger were entitled by law to go into any field and to pick up the ears of grain dropped by the reapers or left standing in the corners of a field. That was the social security system in ancient Judea, the earliest known in history. But there is hardly any doubt that Naomi was hoping that Ruth would light by chance on Boaz's field. She was thinking not only of a livelihood for herself and Ruth, she was thinking of a husband for Ruth. And so it turned out. We read that Ruth went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech, Naomi's dead husband. And Boaz noticed her and asked the foreman who she was. And the foreman answered, It is a Moabitish damsel who came back with Naomi. Thereupon Boaz approached Ruth, and there was a conversation between them, in the course of which Boaz said, It has been fully told me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law after the death of thy husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy birth, and art come into a people that thou knowest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and be thy reward complete from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to take shelter. I must say that this little speech of Boaz is so pious and so ingratiating doesn't make a good impression on me. At last it is clear beyond doubt that he knew all about Naomi's and Ruth's return, yet he had never made an effort to look them up. He hadn't even sent them a parcel of food anonymously. But one might suspect that he was a trifle scared by the arrival in town of his poor relatives. It wasn't until he had seen Ruth that he began to feel nobly about her. Uh, we have to suppose that Ruth was a very beautiful young woman. And the tradition supports that view enthusiastically. And once he had got to know her, his attentions became very marked for a time. We read, Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come hither and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And after the meal, Boaz openly and unembarrassed said to the young men who were harvesting, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and put her not to shame. And also pull out for her from the bundles, and leave it, and let her glean, and do not rebuke her. He was making up to her for his neglect, and we can imagine that it occasioned not a little gossip. Boaz, the wealthy landowner, and the Moabitish girl, by that evening it must have been all over town the whispering on the rooftops and before the doorsteps, the speculation and the envy and perhaps the malice, Boaz, the catch of the town, more than one mother with a marriageable daughter must have had her eyes on him. And on that same evening, when Ruth came home to Naomi, carrying a whole ephah of barley, which is over a bushel, Naomi was astonished. It was obvious that Ruth couldn't have gathered more than a bushel just by gleaning for one day. Someone must have thrown down stuff especially for her. Where hast thou gleaned today? 
Blessed be he that took knowledge of thee. And Ruth answered, The name of the man was Boaz. Boaz. The name meant nothing to Ruth. She had no idea that he was of her husband's family. She saw no special significance in it, except that the man had been interested and kind. But to old Naomi it was like the finger of God. To her it was not a coincidence, but a sign from heaven that the evil destiny which had pursued her till then was about to drop away, and she was to know happiness. And it is as well to note that the happiness that Naomi dreamed of was to spring from the happiness of Ruth. Well then, Naomi had received a sign. There was an immediate change in her outlook. When her wealthy kinsmen had ignored her, she had said nothing about them to Ruth, although she must have said to herself, so this is how matters stand. But when Ruth came home with the bushel of barley and the story of Boaz's attentiveness, she must have said to herself, so this is how matters stand. But all she said to Ruth was, the man is a close relative of ours. And it is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, and that thou be not met in another field. Old Naomi's mind was at work. A sign from heaven didn't mean to her that everything was going to happen according to her highest wishes, and there was nothing for her to do. As she had to cooperate. She had to act. But how? When? We are going to discover that Naomi had an exquisite sense of timing. An ordinary woman might have acted prematurely or might not have acted at all. Not so with Naomi. She waited for the right moment. The weeks went by and the reapers reaped and the gleaners gleaned and every evening Ruth brought home her gleanings and not a word more from or about Boaz. Was he sorry he had been so precipitate? He, the mature man? Was he afraid that young Ruth would not take him? We don't know, because we aren't told. There had been an exciting start, big with promise, and no follow-up. He had shown such friendliness on the first day, and now silence. And Naomi must have said again, so this is how matters stand. In order not to be too hard on Boaz, we must recall that there were certain laws in ancient Judea which affected the situation. If a woman became a widow, the brother of her dead husband was morally bound to marry her. If he refused to do that, he had to submit to a humiliating ceremony. He had to appear in public. The woman took off one of his shoes and spat on the ground in contempt. Before this ceremony, called Chalitza, had been performed, the woman wasn't free to marry again. Now it so happened that Naomi's other relative, who would also be Ruth's relative, was nearer in kinship to her than Boaz. It is not stated that he was a brother of Ruth's dead husband. That would have made him a son of Naomi's. But it seems that he was of sufficiently close kin to come under the application of the Chalitza law. Boaz couldn't marry Ruth until this unnamed relative had released her. And it is possible that Boaz hesitated so long because he was not at all sure that the other relative would release Ruth. But the harvest days were ending. After them, Boaz would hardly ever see Ruth, if at all. True, he wasn't by any means Ruth's last chance. But in Naomi's judgment after the sign, this was the marriage for Ruth. We who live so long after the event can see that Ruth and Boaz were meant for each other. 
But those who lived through the event hadn't our advantage. The time had come for old Naomi to act. We read, And Naomi said unto Ruth, Behold, Boaz will be winnowing barley tonight on the threshing floor. Wash thyself, therefore, and anoint thyself, and put thy best raiment on thee, and get thee down to the threshing floor. But do not make thyself known to Boaz until he shall have finished eating and drinking. Then, when he lieth down, mark the place, and go to him, and uncover his feet, and lie down there, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. We know so little about the customs of those days that we can't determine how much boldness there was in Naomi's counsel and how much convention. We can rule out at once any suggestion of impropriety that would be grossly out of keeping with our characters and with the story. What we do know is that Ruth followed Naomi's instructions to the letter. And in the middle of the night, Boaz awoke, and a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thy handmaid. Spread thy skirt, therefore, over thy handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. To which Boaz replied, Blessed art thou of the Lord, my daughter, but thou hast shown more kindness in the end than at the beginning. For thou didst not follow the young men, rich or poor. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do all that thou sayest. For all the men in the gate of my people know that thou art a virtuous woman. This man, Boaz, really had an unfortunate way of expressing himself. When he first met Ruth, he said, It hath been fully told me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law, and the Lord recompense thy work. And now he tells her, For all the men in the gate of my people know that thou art a virtuous woman. It looks as though he had been waiting for public approval before he decided to act. Perhaps I am doing him an injustice. What looks like offensive caution may only have been an elderly man's awkwardness. The important thing is that he promised to act the next day, and he did. We read, Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat him down there, and the near kinsman came by, and Boaz said to him, Oh, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. Such a one. Not a very courteous way of addressing a man. But the man wasn't the kind to inspire respect, as we shall see in a moment. We read, And Boaz took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And he said to the kinsman, Naomi, that is come back out of the field of Moab, selleth the parcel of land which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to disclose it unto thee, saying, Buy it in the presence of them that sit here. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. Then such a one, or as we would say nowadays, what's his name, answered, I will redeem it. He was willing to buy the parcel of land so that it should remain in the family. But he'd forgotten something. And Boaz reminded him, saying, On the day when you buy that parcel of land from Naomi, you are also buying it from Ruth, the Moabitess. And to buy it, you must marry her, so that she may have children to commemorate her dead husband. Thereupon such a one immediately backed down. He said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar my own inheritance. What did he mean? Just a moment ago, he was ready to acquire the piece of land, and now that he heard he could only do so 
by marrying Rus, he found it didn't pay. The legends tell us that such a one, they give him the name of Tob, I don't know why, didn't know the law. He supposed that Ruth, being a Moabitish woman, wouldn't be protected by that law. And the moment he found out that this law, like the law of gleaming, applied to strangers just as much as to Israelites, he changed his mind. He cuts a rather sorry figure. He wanted the land, and what happened to Ruth afterwards was none of his business. It was of this kind of man that in later years the prophet would say, Woe to those that join house to house, that lay field to field. Let's dismiss him from the story. He introduces a jarring note. For now the story rises to a grand choral climax. We read, And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day, that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Machlon and Chilion's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Machlon, have I acquired to be my wife to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. Ye are the witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is to come into thy house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel, and do thou worthily in Ephrat, and be famous in Bethlehem. Boaz has therefore taken it upon himself to be the surrogate of the dead man, and to be known forever therefore as the husband of Ruth the Moabites. He was to be famous, but only as the husband of Ruth. We who read so much today about husbands who won't accept a secondary role to a great or gifted woman must acknowledge that there was a fine modesty in Boaz. He knew himself to be the less important person and was willing to accept that role. And at this point we feel that the idyll of all times is ended. Ruth the Moabitess has found a fine husband. Naomi will be taken care of for the rest of her days. But just at this point, when it is ending, the story takes the strangest turn imaginable in the last few sentences. We read... So Boaz took Ruth as she became his wife, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son, and the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who hath left thee not without a kinsman, and let his name be famous in Israel, and he shall be unto thee a restorer of life, and a nourisher of thine old age, for thy daughter-in-law, who is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. How extraordinary. Is not this the book of Ruth? And does it not celebrate primarily... Ruth's sweetness and devotion. Naomi certainly plays an important part, but how can the book end so strangely with Naomi at the center of the epilogue and Ruth somewhere at the side? So much so that the women say there is a son born to Naomi, as though the great-great-grandmother of David were Naomi and not Ruth. We get the feeling that the recorder of the story originally thought of Ruth, the more obviously dramatic of the two women as the heroine, and that is how he tried to write it. And certainly Ruth is one of the loveliest and most moving characters known to us. But as he went along, Naomi, with whom the story opens, drew him more and more, even as she had drawn her daughters-in-law, and he was not quite aware of it. And by the time he ended, he had forgotten what he started out to say. He was, in fact, 
a greater artist than he intended to be. We are told that the story of Ruth and Naomi was written as a protest against Jewish chauvinism. Someone recalled it or thought it up at a much later period in the days of Ezra the scribe, when he was compelling the Jews of his time to divorce their foreign and idolatrous wives. I don't accept this view, but I honor it and recognize the points in its favor. It is pleasant to observe how often the text insists on Ruth the Moabites. There is no glossing over of her origins. And if with all this in its favor I reject the theory of a propaganda piece, it is because I do not believe that such great writing can be born of a public relations assignment. It was a spontaneous recording by a man who was a greater artist than he knew. <laughs> Eternal Light series of four talks by Maurice Samuel, author and lecturer, based on his book, Certain People of the Book, published by Alfred A. Knopf, Incorporated. Be with us again next week for the third program in this Eternal Light series, The Story of Isaac and Rebecca. The Eternal Light is produced under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. This pre-recorded program has been an NBC public affairs presentation. This is the NBC Radio Network. In Psalm 63, David said, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips, when I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches. To help you focus your thoughts upon God at the close of this day, we bring you this devotional meditation from Morning and Evening by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great English preacher of the 19th century. This evening's text is found in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 21. This I recall to mind, therefore have I hope. Memory is frequently the bond slave of despondency. Despairing minds call to remembrance every dark foreboding in the past and dilate upon every gloomy feature in the present. Thus memory, clothed in sackcloth, presents to the mind a cup of mingled gall and wormwood, there is, however, no necessity for this. Wisdom can readily transform memory into an angel of comfort. That same recollection which in its left hand brings so many gloomy omens may be trained to bear in its right a wealth of hopeful signs. She need not wear a crown of iron. She may encircle her brow with a fillet of gold, all spangled with stars. Thus it was in Jeremiah's experience. In the previous verse, memory had brought him to deep humiliation of soul. My soul hath them still in remembrance, and is humbled in me. And now this same memory restored to him life and comfort. To this I recall to my mind. Therefore I have hope. Like a two-edged sword, his memory first killed his pride with one edge, and then slew his despair with the other. As a general principle, if we would exercise our memories more wisely, we might, in our very darkest distress, strike a match which would instantly kindle the lamp of comfort. There is no need for God to create a new thing upon the earth in order to restore believers to joy. If they would prayerfully rake the ashes of the past, they would find light for the present. And if they would turn to the book of truth and the throne of grace, their candle would soon shine as before. 
be it ours to remember the loving kindness of the Lord, and to rehearse His deeds of grace. Let us open the volume of recollection which is so richly illuminated with memorials of mercy, and we shall soon be happy. Thus memory may be, as Coleridge called it, the bosom spring of joy, and when the divine comforter bends it to his service, it may be chief among earthly comforters. This meditation was taken from Morning and Evening by C. H. Spurgeon. Please listen each evening at this same time for Morning and Evening. <laughs>